and gentlemen, it's time for Forge the Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy, your host. We have a Bottle Lost Souls podcast. I'm joined tonight by Ricky Addington. Hello world. Yo man, this is going to be a uh, kind of a Sigmar specific show. I've actually, after this, we're going to going to do a segment with uh, Chris Carlisle from WarGamesCon, and then after that, I'm going to do a segment with me and Rob Sines from the Honest Wargamer, where we talk about the the dreaded double turn, that's how I describe it, and then he kind of talks me off that ledge, and some other stuff for the Age of Sigmar uh, second edition release, and then after that, we're going to do a segment with the tournament organizer from Gen Con. For the 40k grand tournament event at Gen Con, one of the largest conventions in the in the U.S. That is a lot of interviews. Okay, that's good. And I, the reason I like having a lot of interviews is I'm not in them, so I can listen to the show and enjoy it. <laughs> not critiquing everything. That, oh, yeah, man, I it's didn't like, mean that. gosh, I didn't do mean I that. really sound that country? Oh, uh, you you do. I do. You yeah, I've been told. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's all right. It's part of your charm. Did I tell you I had a guy at Adepticon like yell at me from like across the hall and I was like, hey, are you Ricky Addington? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> he said, I thought so. Yeah, I, mean, I you like, thought so. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so apparently that uh, that Southwest Virginia is real strong. Man, I'm, I'm pumped about uh, Age of Sigmar and I, I'm going to talk about a game that I played last night. But I also want to talk about uh, we did a, a practice tournament for the ATC. The ATC is coming up. Oh yeah, in, in three weeks, and we we practiced. We had a, a really good time here at the place. Had uh, four tables going. Probably had twenty people hanging out. It was um, it was an awesome time. It, and nothing nothing replaces playtesting. But when you can playtest that many games all in the same place uh, while eating some good food and hanging out with friends, nothing's better than that. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I should have been there. I'm sorry. We had our uh, we had our tournament here for our store. We ended up having. 18 people or 17 show up so that is huge that's, for, that's great for your area and you know for, it's, for it's, gate city virginia but, but to actually yeah. enthusiasm <laughs> for 40k right now i mean there's going to be 300 people playing 40k in, in the team tournament and and all the other side events and stuff i'm i'm really jazzed and yeah i i'm taking yanari so you know whatever it's going to be what it is uh, but I'm, I'm happy with the list. It plays really well. We got a lot of good playtest games in and I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing what the, what the team does this year. Follow, we'll be posting a lot of stuff on, on Twitter and Facebook as we get closer to that. And I also tried to post some uh, shots from the practice stuff. You can, you can find the Twitter at warmaster underscore TPM or find us on Facebook at Forge Narrative. Anyway, it was cool having the, the wrong way kids come together and play some games. Great, great weekend all together. But then, Yesterday, we're recording this on Thursday. Yesterday, I played a game of Age of Sigmar 2.0. I played my Sylvaneth because it's the, I've got them mostly ready for the tabletop. Although, I have built four squads of, uh, I'm sorry, I built three squads of the Spite Revenants. And I've got my fourth squad coming because I'm taking the Dreadwood War Scroll Battalion. Which, yeah, need, I, which I needs saw four the, units of spite revenants. <laughs> yeah, I saw that you were putting spite revenants. I was like, I just saw revenants. I was like, revenants? Oh, man, let's see what Paul's got cooking here. Because my buddy, he plays uh, just the normal, what is it, the other one, the tree revenants? Is that it? Yep. Yeah, and I swear they, they literally pop up die and go away but i think uh, i think you got a, a little bit better plan going for your spot revenants so we'll, we'll see how that works you know, out we'll, we'll see how it is they they, they affect uh battle shock yeah. around people and then being able to i'm going i'm going for that ultra competitive side where i'm having a one drop army mm -hmm. since everything comes down in a battalion it's a big deal <laughs> it's, it's a battalion in a battalion it comes down and then i get to do some manipulation now i played against zinch and I've heard some people concerned that Zinch's points increase in Age of Sigmar are, are uh, punitive or are, are something are going to make them not competitive. Let me tell you, they don't. St still still holding <laughs> it's strong? It's still, still pretty good. <laughs> Just the mortal wound spells that they can dump out and then yeah. all, the, all the summoning of the, the various. The summoning is where it's going to be kind of crazy, right? Like, and let me ask you this. In your game, with the way Zinch summons now, they get their points based off of just spells being cast spells by either player. Spells in period being cast, yes. Right. You get, you get so, spells being cast, and then you get uh, pink horrors turning into blue horror points. And I mean, there's there's a couple of different ways to dump units on the table. Right. Now, my question, because I've not got to play against them in second edition yet, my question is, does that deter you from casting your spells? Do you, do you look at that and say, is it worth it for me to cast this spell since I'm just going to help him? Is that something well, you want to do is delay that? Let me put it this way. I summoned 
dryads with my spells. Mm-hmm. So take your point. I'm getting my ten dryads. <laughs> and I also summoned cogs. You know, as I mentioned, the cogs I think are the uh, the most powerful endless spell uh, in the game because of what they what they do the plus two movement or the extra spell or whatever. Right. Uh, but uh, now, granted, I'm not the expert, and I, but I'm going to become I'm going to become better at Sigmar, and because this edition is really engaging to me, and I'm jazzed about playing it, and I like the way it flows better than the previous edition. Now, what Rob's going to say in the the spot we have coming up is that it's the exact same. Why 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 weren't you jiving on it before? You know, mm-hmm. and I agree with him there's a lot of things that are the exact same but there were there were just in in the previous edition there felt like there were just a couple of things at, over the course of a turn that that felt kind of i don't want to say it wasn't disjointed but it didn't feel like the 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 flow of 40k that's the best way of describing it and oh, really and now the flow is it, it, I, I don't want to say it's like 40k because it's not it's it's a decidedly different game and we talk about that in the segment so i don't want to give it all away it's coming up <laughs> after the war games con segment but um it's it's a decidedly its own game with its own very very complex strategies but I feel like the flow of the game is a little bit more intuitive than it was in the previous edition. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think you and I will have to have a conversation about that sometime because I'm not real – I don't really see a huge difference. What I do see is with the endless spells being in there, I, I see those as being kind of a, a spoiler, I guess. Not, not Maybe not a spoiler, but definitely a factor when it comes to that double turn, you know, and like – I like the way that now the double turn is going to determine who gets, I, I guess not, not the double turn, but the turn priority is going to determine who gets to move those endless spells first. Uh, so I'm really interested to see that dynamic now where it's not just a guaranteed, of course, I'm going to take the double turn because if I do that, my opponent may shove my spell back on me or something. So I think there's a lot more uh, dynamic things going on in the game. But overall, I think the game is still. You should listen to that segment coming up in twenty minutes or so. It's <laughs> no, it, it's good. It's it's coming from the perspective of someone who's like really good at Sigmar. Yeah, you know, and and uh, and what the what the double turn because you hear that and people talk about oh man, I don't want to deal with that double turn, but we talk about specifically how to deal with it. Yeah, uh, or at yeah. least it, okay, we give the the one hundred and one the entry level course on how to deal with it. Uh, with, yeah, with more to come, more to come on that. Well, I think, uh, I think, yeah, and a, a biggie with that is you just have to plan for it. You know, you plan to be able to absorb that because in 40K, you know, I'm going to go, you go, and then I'm going to go again. Uh, so you can plan to be way more aggressive in certain areas, but in Sigmar, which is a game where in Sigmar movement is huge, right? So in Sigmar, you kind of have to move and prepare for that double turn and it, it just, it makes the game a lot more tactical when you're doing everything. But primarily, I've always thought that Sigmar was a game of movement. So uh, it's so that's what we talk about. Part of what we talk about is is that the fact that the hero phase is the first phase, and you don't get mm-hmm. to move. Like like we talk about how you know, you know oh, I'm just going to move in range and uh, whatever. I don't. I'm not going to give it away, Ricky. People got to hold tight and listen. Let's talk about something else because I'm going to I'm going to talk about everything. Just talk about <laughs> Let something me else. Talk about uh, the deepkin, like uh, with. <laughs> is that it with a tide caster paint yeah. her eyes, paint her eyes closed no one should paint her eyes open <laughs> everyone i've seen has crazy eyes well does a tide caster have eyes uh this is the, the i think the there's, a, there's a female caster uh with that with uh with kind of, with very pronounced sculpted eyes okay and All they, right. look, they look a lot better with the eyes closed for everyone that i've seen it's been a hundred percent better with the eyes closed yeah well like you know the the thralls i don't even think they have eyes they kind of have like sockets but they don't really have eyes uh See? let me let me tell you not- this is the, going back and revisiting the painting like the hobby side uh-huh. uh where i have been painting these spite revenants and i and i've got uh f- four squads pa- completed build built but i used all my death world forest on the necron project that i was doing so i, don't, I can't <laughs> i have to get to the hobby store to get some Death World Forest. It was funny. Someone was making fun of me on, on Twitter for not including camo shade in the recipe uh, for yeah. the paint. And I actually thought that it used Colia Green Shade. Then I went back and watched the tutorial. Nope, it's camo shade. So. <laughs> you know, if if you could somehow do it, I would I would pay 
a good sum of money if like you know you could have a, a comic store or a game store that would have outside of the store like a paint like a instead of like a snack machine it just distributed paint for like at two in the morning <laughs> when you're like knee deep in a project that's, that's exactly now, right you need to just get there and get some paint uh, well, I'm, I'm experimenting with squad markings on these guys. Now, this is stuff that translates into, you know, to anything, but the, the, uh, the spite revenants have like a, they're, they're half what elf spirit merged with a tree folk of some kind. Yep. And I'm changing the, the ghostly, the ethereal effect, effects to represent the different squads. So I've done the traditional, like, bluish ghostly effect on one, one squad, and I've done a purplish ghostly effect on the next squad, and I'll just, and I'll go through the different pastel colors. Nice. For each of those to represent the squad. Now, on my bases, I actually squad mark them also with the colors of flowers. So one squad has pink and and orange flowers the other has white and yellow flowers and you know in different combinations of the of actual tufts of flowers on the bases and that's one way of doing it but i think these these spike are going to turn out all right yeah i like that idea of just doing it with some flowers or something because it's always kind of hard to figure out you know what how am i going to mark these branches as being different branches than those branches, you know. Especially so it's supposed to look like the same forest in the same right. season. That's because I, yeah, I'm yeah. painting everything a very uh, early bloom, you know, like er, like right after everything's bloomed in spring, and so I want everything to be bright and vibrant and alive. And so you're not going to have a fall or a winter, right, or, you know, yeah, or different, yeah. different. Everything's in full on on thriving live bloom. Yeah, it wouldn't make sense. And but my, uh, I saw I saw one where a guy had done all fall colors and had gotten some of the uh, like the the orange and brown leaves and put them all over his tree yes. lords and stuff. That looks so cool. Yeah, they absolutely do. I mean, there's there's not a a wrong way to paint these. I don't think the the Sylvaneth models because they just are so cool looking. That's just what I've chosen to go with. I want everything to be all you know, yeah very very bright because it's different than the other armies that I have. Uh, and and just decidedly use this as a hobby project. I think the wrong way to paint them would to be like spray paint them with lead belcher. That would probably be the wrong way. They are but... from the realm of metal, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. You forge that narrative. Okay. <laughs> I was using some uh, 40k terrain and uh and uh, because you know I thought what a realm of metal or whatever, but it's airy terrain and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the picture, it's like someone said we found the uh, the Sylvanesque sprinkler unit because <laughs> it's, it's a it's the pipes, it's the Promethean pipes or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, we we actually did that. Uh, we had uh, one of our Firestorm the campaign. We had a, we had a game we were playing, and one of the places we chose to play was uh it was something called like the Infinite Cogs or something. I can't remember. It's like, yeah. but in the in the book, it gives this description of it is. Basically, this huge, uh, like this whole plane is taken over by like all this manufacturing and like dwarven machinery and stuff like that. And so we ended up putting a lot of 40k terrain out there, the like the Necromunda terrain with the mm-hmm. the tanks and the platforms and stuff. And it worked well. It worked really well. And it was actually kind of fun to see Stormcast Eternals climbing over Promethean pipelines. <laughs> terrain terrain makes the game at, in Sigmar too. And, and that was one of the neat things about you know I told you we all came together for a 40k tournament this past weekend. And people brought terrain. We had terrain here from three different states, you know, just to have some really rich uh, table on the uh, terrain on the tables. It has such an impact on how the game is played. And you've got to do it. Uh, and you know, how I've done it with, is I've gone and gotten some MDF board from Home Depot. You know, we talk about this all the time, how you can get Home Depot to cut the wood for you. Yeah. It, you know, you might have to sweet talk them a little bit to get more than two cuts. Uh, yeah, what, well, with the, yeah, without paying for it, because they start to get grumpy. <laughs> you ever notice that? <laughs> they, you they're good with that nice, two really? cuts. Yeah, you're like, hey, man, can I get you? Let's just do one. I'm like, I really need this four by this uh, two yeah. by eight or two by four cut into you know two two by twos, and then can you cut this two by two down into like one <laughs> foot strips. <laughs> You can just see it. They're all smiles for this first couple. Then all of a sudden, they, then it's a job. You know, all of a sudden it's work. I've noticed that. But and know, then they'll want, start counting cuts. We used to say that you wanted 25% on the table, but now you got to have more. You got to have, it's not just 25%. Maybe it's like 30% on the table, but you also need stuff that has height that actually blocks line of sight. 
Oh, yeah. I actually had uh, one of my buddies complain at our last tournament that there was too much terrain on the table. <laughs> I I asked him to leave. <laughs> like, well, I mean, of course, you, you just get out. <laughs> diminishing returns, you know, with, with yeah. the terrain. But it is such a it's such a big factor of the game, you know, with oh, yeah. models having to be wholly, you know, not say wholly within. They have to be in the cover. Uh, and then other things have to be obscured and in the cover. You know, it's... And just having a lot of sight blocking is, is huge, you yeah. know, and, and so you, you want that variety of terrain. You want you want terrain that's going to let people get a cover save. You're going to want terrain that's going to block line of sight and uh, and and do all these things. But you'll you'll find if, if that's not the kind of terrain you normally play on, I think you'll find that the game is uh, a lot more fun and engaging uh, when, you know, you're you're running from cover to cover with your fragile units or, you know, trying to trying to position yourself so that you can take advantage of all these cover saves and stuff and block line of sight. And it, it makes, you remember when eighth came out, it seemed like there was just so many armies that could just sit on the backfield and just shoot you yeah, off the table. Line type armies, right? yeah. And so when you start putting terrain on the table that blocks that line of sight, then all of a sudden they have to come out and, and actually play the game. Well, they, that's it. They have to play the game. I mean, that, yeah, and that's exactly. what you want. And that, that's what allows, that's one that's, that's what's going to continue to allow this, uh, this game to evolve and, and, and can still keep the same feel of people wanting to play what they want to play. You got to shape up this terrain. Where I was going is that, that board I was talking about that cut, cut down an area terrain pieces. Now, I mean, I did put some, a ter- like a terrain piece on it that would obscure mm-hmm. some things, you know, shoot, if you're shooting across it and look nice or whatever, give a good aesthetic to the table, but that's, you know, $7 worth of materials. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's things you can do uh, and still make it, you can put your hobby touch on it, you know, texture paint uh, with a couple of dry brushes and some, some, maybe some extra static grass and you've got a, a sharp looking piece of cover. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I just go to Lowe's get a thing oh, of fancy like, yeah well you can't hide money uh <laughs> but they and they have military discount it's nice but uh just go get like a thing of sand like playground sand you know there from lowe's and what i also use is kitty litter you mix a little bit of kitty litter in with your sand mix oh, it up with some texture, glue. Yep. yeah and you throw it down there and you got sand and rocks boom you're done you spent like six bucks and that will last you for years i've had the same thing of kitty litter in my basement for years people are like you don't have a cat and i'm like it's for warhammer i promise i i ran out now don't i hope, I hope she's not listening by the way she's not but, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, i ran out of white glue uh-huh and so i went and kind of rummaged through my wife's hobby stuff and <laughs> got some uh matte Gel matte medium, uh-huh. which is like a generic Mod Podge. Okay, I know the stuff you're talking about. Actually. That yeah. stuff okay. has almost like the perfect consistency to stick basing material to bases. Yeah, and it's it's easy to work with because it's got that already. It's in a, it's in a different pot. You're not squeezing out glue and everything. It's on its own yeah. little pot. Yeah. Brush goes right in, right on the stuff. Sprinkle the sand on, and you are done. Boom! There you go. I'm telling you, I think we've all rated our wives. Generic. Yeah, yeah, I think we've all rated. <laughs> our wife's uh, a hobby bin too. Like I, I did that. My wife, her little sewing bin has all kinds of little craft things in it. And I don't think she knows all the stuff I've stolen out of that. Sometimes over the years. you need a push pin to unclog your glue thing. Oh my gosh. You don't even know her, uh, her, what do you call it? Like her, her pin cushion is actually in here in my hobby room right now <laughs> because my glue gets clogged all That's, the time. So there you every, go. yeah, she does. I don't think she knows that, but well, she's probably not listening either, Ricky. I don't know what to tell you. Oh no, she doesn't listen to the show. <laughs> Uh, I know we're rambling a little bit, but we are getting ready for the ATC, and so we're planning uh, armies that that are designed to do well in the ATC, which is a is a team event to where you match up. You you try your best to get favorable matchups for each one of your players. Now it doesn't always work out that way, but how you do that is building some lopsided type armies. And so the ar- the army advice we probably have to work on right now. Probably not the most applicable for like a, a local tournament. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, never. Yeah. yeah never. I mean, <laughs> not, not, not this stuff. No, it's just not. Uh, but it has been an excuse. Like I didn't have hemlocks before. So, uh, I, I, I'm trying to hobby out and get these hemlocks and Crimson Hunter Exarchs done before. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't used that stuff. I, 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 I thought it was a, a, a little too efficient. That's about the, about the best way I'll describe it. <laughs> I find it shocking that you didn't own three hemlocks. Those things are really good. Well, I don't even on the shelf, but I, yeah. but I didn't. I didn't have them together. But this is oh, a great okay. excuse to break them out and paint them. There you go. Yeah, because like I don't even play Eldar, but just messing around with uh, Harlequins. 
I would I have like three hemlocks like in my shopping cart right now on, on the GW. So, good. so it's, Look, I know we're not telling anybody anything they didn't already know, but hemlocks are so good. But if you listen to the, the 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 show we did last week where we had Brant on, Mike Brant on, he's talking about Tauroxes. Now, I've always had this kind of like weird fascination with the Taurox model. I think it looks pretty cool. It doesn't necessarily fit 100% with my catechins, but yet I still want it. And listening to his strategy on how he uses it is really making me want to put them together and paint some of those too. Yeah, I was uh, I was really excited about his list. Just just somebody, you know, playing catechin without artillery. <laughs> it's uh, shocking, frankly, but, uh, you know, I, I like the sound of his list. I liked uh, listening to what he what he did with it. It was really cool. But well, he attacked dude, the I, format, and that's really what – and that's what he did. He attacked the format yeah, and it, and it, yeah. in a fresh way, uh, in my opinion, that – that with that perspective, it's easy. To, it's a little bit easier to attack other formats. Like you know, you can look at your missions in whatever tournament format you're going in, going into, and try to attack it that way. And the ATC is also is its own different animal. Yeah, it's it's kind of one of those things. It's like okay, take everything you do for a uh, for a singles event, and let's just kind of set that to the side. You're going to use about a quarter of that, and now just come up with the most ridiculous thing you can come up with in this certain niche area of the game and let that do what it's going to do. <laughs> yeah. Try be, uh, be a little bit degenerate, I think is the <laughs> in your list design in your list design. Yeah. Yeah. Be, be a great person once the game starts, but your list design at ATC should be offensive. You know, when you show up, somebody's going to look at your list and go, Oh, Oh, you did that. You did that. that that's wow. what you're going for. You want that, uh, yeah. that disgust factor. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've went to a table at ATC and, you know, the first thing I say is, really? And that's, that's kind of, but it's stuff that wouldn't win, it it wouldn't win out, you know, in a, in a regular tournament. You wouldn't win all three games, but you might, you might win all five of your games at the ATC. Yeah. Yeah. Because like it, it just can't, it can't compete at, at any other, like, what am I trying to say? Like at a normal GT. Yeah. When you're trying to fight through the circuit. Because you can't, you can't take all comers with a lot of the stuff we see at, ATC, but at ATC, when you can avoid ma- bad matchups and and put yourself in a position to win those games, then all of a sudden your really interesting niche list all of a sudden becomes a powerhouse. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's all the fun of it. Well, Ricky, let's let's take a break. When we come back, it'll be me with uh, Chris Carlisle from War Games Con, and then after that, it's going to be me and Rob from the Honest War Gamer, and then after that, it's going to be me and Eddie Draper from uh, the Mad Circuit going up into sorry Mag Circuit uh, sir, from the Mags Circuit going up into Gen Con. Uh, so thanks for listening, and we'll catch y'all after these breaks. Make sure to tune in for all the segments. Have a good night. Good night. You're listening to Forge the Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to a tournament spotlight on Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy. I'm joined tonight by Chris Carlisle. Woo! Hey man, we're here to talk about War Games Con. That's right. In Austin, Texas. Absolutely. Uh, with uh, Affiliated with one of our primary sponsors, Bella Lost Souls. Bella Lost Souls, that's right. Uh, really great to have you on. Uh, this is War Games Con is well, one, it's an awesome event. Uh, I've I've been to it many times in the past, uh, and this year you guys are prepared to host 128 players for the Warhammer 40k tournament, 40 uh, 2000 point grand tournament, and this is August 17th through the 19th in Austin, Texas, like I like I just said. But you guys also have an Age of Sigmar tournament that uh, you continue to add places to because you keep selling out. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing on the AOS turnaround. Last year, as comparison, we had like eight players. We're up to <laughs> sixty-one now. Well, I mean th- that's awesome. I mean, I think I think you mentioned that you had you know like three spots left open, and, and then but you may have increased it again if the enthusiasm continues to build in second edition. It, I mean, I'm, it's bringing people out. I mean, heck, I, I know I'm. I've uh, ten, very tonight. I was painting uh, twenty uh, dryads and some uh, spite uh, revenants for the Sylvaneth army. I mean, yeah, Sylvaneth. I mean, really excited about about this edition so I can see why you're getting enthusiasm. We're, we are talking about the 40K tournament. Last year, you guys had a little over 80 folks. This year, you, you plan to meet the cap of 128 players. So there's uh, there's definitely some uh, some tickets are selling now, but there are still some spots open for that. 
Yes. Dude, man, thanks for coming on and talking with me. Um, so tell me a little bit about the environment. Where, what the, what's the hotel? Uh, what's it around? How, how can people get tickets? All right. So we're, uh, we're hosting at the Doubletree again. This is our 10th year. We've been doing it for that long, oldest in Texas. And it's at the Doubletree Hotel. It's a really nice area. We've got a couple uh, restaurants you can just walk to. Uh, you got Papacitos, which is a really nice Mexican restaurant. Papa Do's, which is a Cajun restaurant, which is really popular. You got your standard chilies right down the way as well. And for those worried about food and what have you, we also have the uh, ability to purchase a nice uh, grab-and-go lunch, too, in the hotel itself for pretty cheap. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, is that something yeah, you, that that way you don't have to too? worry about it? Or is, or is that something they just get on, on site? Uh, so you can purchase the tickets ahead of time on our website, www.wargamescon.com. Uh, along with the registration with your uh, tickets, you can go ahead and pick those. You've got a couple different options there for sandwiches and uh, sandwiches and drinks. Uh, that way you can just grab your lunch right there. That will be ready to go for you with the uh, uh, proof of purchase tickets, and then you're good to go. You don't have to worry about finding where you're going to get lunch. Man, that's awesome. And then, you know, at night when the sun is down, because let me tell you, walking. Now, when you said the hotels are within, I'm sorry, the restaurants are within walking distance, they really are. Like, there's they're across the street, and one's right next to the hotel. And then there's, yeah, literally. I mean, it's it's right there. Yeah, two of the two big ones are right there, and the Chili's is not is you know right next to one of the other ones. It's really, but it is in the summertime in Austin, so you want to be doing that <laughs> yeah. when in the evening after you're done playing, and then maybe go have a couple of adult beverages at one of these restaurants. Yeah, and then jump in the pool because you're gonna need it. <laughs> so this hotel, it's a it's a double treat, which means uh, also cookies. Oh man, those cookies! They're so good. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Double Tree cookies. Uh, so, but I, I wanted to, I like to eat, so I wanted to make sure that we got that information out to folks that there are very accessible places to chill and relax. Uh, and the hotel also has cookies. So yeah, it's a nice go. atmosphere. It's a good hotel. They've done, uh, in the past, you know, it's a Double Tree, but now it's owned by Hilton. So they spent a lot of money renovating. So it's a really nice hotel now. Oh, that's that's pretty cool. I, I enjoyed it the last time I was there, which was... Uh, yeah, it was it already had, a pretty nice hotel. Well, it had like a, you know, a Spanish theme to it with a nice courtyard and... Oh, yeah. Uh, just a just a, a pretty pretty nice environment, even the halls. Like everything was, you know, it just, it just felt nice and looked good. And, you know, I can only imagine that's gotten better over, over time. I, I've not been there in a, in a couple of years. Uh, it's a But it's it's a destination tournament. It's some place that I, I enjoy going put on by good folks yeah it's uh we're, we're excited to be in our 10th year like i said we're uh uh the hotel's good you know the venue's good the food's good the the tournament atmosphere is really good we got lots of good vendors uh you know what's not like not the like oh yeah uh we got you know a couple of people coming we got nick nonavante he's going to come down and play um we got the the Grand Clash for Shadespire also. Man, it's just so much cool Shadespire stuff. Shadespire and Age of Sigmar are obviously taking off. And, uh, and you know, WarGamesCon always attracts so, some good quality players. There's going to be a lot of good competition there. Now, the mission format, uh, you're, I think you're going to be doing some uh, some – some specific missions to your event, uh, which is awesome. I just did the same thing in a tournament I just ran a couple of weeks ago, and it's great to have that variety out there. But uh, I assume when they are done, they will be up for download on the WarGamesCon website. Yeah, yeah, we're doing some, you know, some last minute play testing just to make sure the missions are good. They they'll be very it itc esque, and and as far as you'll have some primaries and some secondaries to work on throughout the throughout the game. Uh, but they won't be the the exact standard that everybody's used to. And this is August seventeenth through through the nineteenth. That is correct. Friday, so, Saturday, Sunday. Are yeah. So you, it, does the tournament? Does the forty k tournament uh, span? Uh, you know, all three days, or is that just Saturday and Sunday? I think that's just the forty k tournament. What can folks yeah. do on Friday night? So Friday Friday is you know a couple of the smaller events as well as the forty k team tournament event. Uh, the GT itself is going to be Saturday Sunday. And Austin itself is a bit of a character. Oh, oh yeah. If you haven't, you know, oh, I can't even explain everything in one sitting of all the things that you can do here in Austin. But as far as nightlife, you are from where we're at. It's a short uh, Uber to downtown uh, to knock out all the the six street bars. Uh, and if you want to bring your family, we've got the uh, the uh, Barton Springs. It would be a great place the to go. Downtown is, is, a, is a really uh, chill area. I mean, it's a college town, essentially, when you get downtown. 
Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, UT is pretty much right across the street from where we're going to be at. Uh, yeah, and so and that translates into I know there was a you know, movement keep Austin weird, you know, for a while. Uh, but there's all kind of food trucks. The culture of the city is, I mean, it's great. It's it's awesome. It really is. It's it's hard to uh, you know of all the places that I've been around the country, Austin is one of my favorite places simply for the culture of the city. And that translates into you guys and how you run the event, of course. But if you're you know we we talk about going out to dinner uh, in the evenings, there are other things you could do as well. Even if you don't go to a specific place, you might want to check out some things around the town. That's absolutely true. It's a very unique town for sure. You know, small town feel in a big city. Yeah, that's that's. I think that's a good way to describe it. Uh, so, what what are some of kind of the, the the tournament monsters as far as like army lists in your area? Do you expect to see certain types of builds, or um, you know what we've seen at other tournaments is really like a mixed bag? Like people are doing well with lots of things. Are you experiencing that in your area right now? And do you expect that to transfer you know, into what people see at the tournament? So, uh, leading into this, I want to preface with, uh, something else we've been excited about here in Texas. We've been, uh, all of the TOs here in Texas have gotten together and created the Texas tournament, uh, circuit where all of the five major GTs, uh, essentially is you want the top, you go to three of them and your top scores all, you know, aggregate to see who's going to be the winner. And we've got this nice belt that we're going to award out for the winner, as well as a nice uh, team trophy for the best team. And going around to all the tournaments so far, uh, you know, Alamo GT, the Dallas Open that just happened, this weekend a Sidewinder in El Paso, and we got Warzone Houston coming up. Uh, we've had pretty good, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head as far as pretty mixed bag as far, you know, you got the top dogs. We got Dark Eldar right now. Imperial Knights coming out, uh, pretty soon is going to shake up the meta, I think. Um, you got some, a few chaos players, you know, hanging on. And, uh, you know, some Unari and Custodes, obviously. Um, we even had, I think in Dallas, there was a Gene Steeler Colt player that did pretty good too. Oh, wow. Well, that's good. So yeah, mixed bag. I mean, I was taking some snapshots from, uh, from people that play in different areas of the country. And it sounds like, I mean, that, that's what I like to see. I really like to, uh, to see these. Uh, people being able to take homegrownness, what they actually want to play, because that makes these types of tournaments so much more enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously the there's always going to be the big bad right now with uh, Agents of Vect, but I think once that <laughs> cools down and and uh, trickles away, and a lot of the bandwagoners move away from it, it'll be. You know, it won't be every army that you expect to face that you have to fight against that. Oh, whatever. I'm happy to be able to talk about Dark Eldar and Jukari, you know, as <laughs> it were, know, right? as, as a competitive army. I mean, they've, they, <laughs> they deserve it. Now, I think that Agents of Vect is, I've often touted it as the most powerful strategy in the game that it is. Um, oh, yeah, it absolutely is. You're, I, go, you're going to see As it. a Dark Eldar player, I fully expected to get the Tide of Traitors treatment. <laughs> well, we'll see. I don't, I don't necessarily speculate that. But you guys will uh, use whatever the current FAQs. Is that, is that correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We always, you know, like to do the, the standard, you know, 30 days before anything that's published before then is, is fair game. That's good. And, and all what, like, that's all published right now on the website. People can go and get their tournament tickets and know what to expect on tournament day. Yes, that's correct. Um, it, do you also list like what the, maybe the cut off cut off for new material is? Is, it, is that always going to be thirty days? Is it going to be like you know, two weeks yeah. for a FAQ, thirty days for a codex, or is it just thirty days out? That's that's what it's going to be running with on August seventeenth and nineteenth. Yes, thirty day, thirty days prior is going to be the cut off for anything new. Uh, so expect you know Imperial Knights are going to be good to go, and you know we've already had the big FAQ, so we're not expecting any any kind of shakeups there. Yeah, yeah, that we should, that should be, the game should be pretty, uh, I guess, even and, uh, operate as expected until the next big one. And then we, yeah, <laughs> we see, but you know, whatever. I, that's, that's kind of, I'd, I'd rather roll with it, uh, and get a much better game because, you know, I wasn't kidding. This is not, this is not just radio talk. The enthusiasm for 40k tournaments specifically is incredibly high. People want to be out rolling dice, uh, with their models in this edition. Oh yeah, and the the competition here in Texas is fierce. Like it's always, you know, the top couple of people at the at the at the top slugging it out. Uh, you know, I'd like to really have a couple of people, you know, come in from outside of our meta and smash them face. Well, I, th- I think you'll get it. I think you'll get uh, folks that are that are wanting to take part either in the tournament circuit. Like, I'm actually, um, uh, you mentioned this is the, the I'm doing a couple of tournament spotlights, and each one so far has mentioned a bit of a circuit. I think I'm going to start uh, building up a little rivalries between these circuits. 
Uh, and and even if I have to do a little uh, little wrestling promos for for some of the players themselves, <laughs> I think it'd be fun to get a little competition, a little friendly, a little friendly rivalry between some of these circuits uh, to to see, you know, again, get some participation and see who's the best, of the best. Oh yeah, you know, you guys can't be Texas, but you know, bring yeah. it on. Oh, that big talk from Austin, you know. <laughs> but we'll see how it goes. I think that'll be fun to to kind of watch and see how things unfold because you know, again. People are wanting to come out and play in tournaments. Heck, I, you know, I'm going to a lot more tournaments, even running a couple of tournaments, just because it's so it's so much fun right now to be rolling dice, and especially in an organized play event. So, what what are the top categories for prizes and stuff that people can compete for uh, at War Games Con? Oh man, so it's one. Of, it's good you brought that up. One of the things that we wanted to focus on uh, is not so much uh, prizes as far as like you know getting you know boxes of toys you know, toy soldiers, but we are really focusing on, uh, really badass trophies. Um, so we got, you know, the winner of the GT is going to get just this really cool, uh, servo skull with the, with a cowboy hat on it. It's going to be all painted up nice and everything. Uh, like I was talking about the Texas tournament champion winner is going to get this like wrestling belt with all these rhinestones and stuff on it. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then we're going to have this uh, really cool Inquisitor sword uh, mounted on a plaque. And what we're going to do is the best team from each year is going to get their name on the plaque. And that's kind of, kind of, you know, mosey, mosey its way around Texas each year for the, the best uh, circuit champions that year. Man, that's, um, that's awesome. That, and that's the, really what people want to play for. Like, heck, I've, yeah. come away, I've come away with a belt buckle from, uh, from War Games Con before. Yeah, just yeah. those little mementos. You Going to, to Texas them, think, and winning a, winning a belt buckle, you know. <laughs> 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 One of those, you know, grossly oversized cowboy style buck belt buckles. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I remember that way more than I do if I got a, a box of Terminators or something. Right, right, exactly. Um, on top of that, uh, I don't know if you remember way back in the day, we also had a local lady here that was super popular. Uh, you know, she's called the the Dice Bag Lady. Oh yeah. So for all of the best of faction stuff, we're having these custom dice bags printed up with the faction logo and our logo on it. That's a great idea. Yeah, people are gonna love those. I think so. That that's what keeps people uh, playing, you know, engaged. You know, like man, I just had a couple of ter- tough games, but I feel like I'm going in for best for Blood Angels. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> man, that's pretty neat. Well, what is some uh, anything else you can think of that people just absolutely need to know that we may have a coverage yet? I mean, the dates, thewargamescon.com. Uh, going to be plenty of news coming out on, on this show and uh, from the Bell Lost Souls website. Uh, what else do people need to know? Oh, uh, speaking of Bell Lost Souls. Uh, one of the things that we've partnered with them uh, is is they're going to be streaming the top table all weekend. That's great. So people can follow it even if they can't make it. I suggest right. making it, but you'll be able to follow it yeah, even yeah. if you can. Coming out and hanging out with us, a nice, relaxed uh, tournament, some fierce competition, but you know, nice, nice and relaxed. Hang out with us. Atmosphere is going to be great and fun. Uh, and then, yeah, you know, if you can't make it, you at least you get to see the top tables rolling around. Now, I know we focused on the 40K tournament, and we, we mentioned the Sigmar tournament, how that's blowing up. But there are other events, like you mentioned Shadespire. There, there are even more events than that going on that weekend. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we've got our narrative event run by the narrative guys, same guys who do the LVO um, narrative event last couple of years. Great guys, Dan and Glenn, they do a phenomenal job of constructing a cohesive game for everybody to have fun with. Those guys just, you'll be in the middle of a game, you'll just hear them across the hall, just, you know, something amazing just happened. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, the AOS tournament is really kicking off. We're going to have a, a big 64 size tournament this year. It's amazing. Uh, we got Shadespire, Blood Bowl, uh, Guild Ball, War Machine still kicking around. It's going to be just a, you know, it's it's a con. It's a full-on con. Oh, man, Chris, that's great. It's in a cool hotel, cool environment, great city run by good folks. I mean, this is this is going to be, I said, we mentioned a destination event. People people need to check it out if they're not familiar. Man, I really appreciate you coming on and talking to me. Let's catch up uh, maybe uh, again before the event, but definitely afterwards and see how it went. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man, have a good rest of your night. Cool, you too. Take care. FTN is also on Facebook. Please like us at www.facebook.com forward slash forge the narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special segment of Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host. I've got Mr. Rob Sines from The Honest Wargamer. Hi everyone. Hi Paul. Nice to talk to you. Nice to talk to everyone. Oh man, I, you know, Age of Sigmar, brand new edition. Mm-hmm. What, do you th- what do you think? 
uh, I think it's going to be a really exciting few months while we're all working it out. Um, we just, as of as of today, recording this, I don't know when it's going to go out, but as of today, something like a 40-page a FAQ has arrived, obviously, because effectively, from the outside looking in, it looks very much like it's a new edition, and while the old battle tomes are kind of relevant, they're not necessarily 100% relevant in some cases, so there's been some big updates to those, which is free, which is nice. Uh, so them publishing the rules. Uh, let me tell you what exactly what them publishing the rules early did was. Uh, I played a game last night. This is prior to release uh, with someone who has never played Sigmar before because they're very excited about getting going. Oh well, that's great news. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 the rules always being free has been um, like well the ma- the data sheets. I suppose if there's a 40k equivalent for your fans, uh, always being free has been a massive tenant. Of, of Age of Sigma. Obviously now there's like allegiance abilities and command items and stuff all behind paywalls of, of, of battle tomes. Um, but you get a general gist of how an army might play just from reading their war scrolls, which is, which is great. And it's all on the app. And I advise anyone to download the app because you can spend hours of your life reading through all those different things. It's really fun. <laughs> well, what's neat is that even the, like the, some of the most basic troops have these, uh, several layers of abilities that if you learn how to kind of master them, then you're going to get, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be a lot more strategic. Uh, you can make some things happen in games. You could turn some, some touch, you know, kind of sticky situations into, into victories for you. I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 actually re- quite interesting that because when I first read through 40k while I was still working for Games Workshop, I was actually a little bit disappointed that there wasn't quite as many uh, unique kind of abilities on the data sheets, um, and and some of the some of the small abilities like Wrathmongers have got just a single ability um, that if a, a monster slays them or one of them dies, they they pick a model within three inches and and they can attack with it. Now that's not bad if they're just killed by a dryad, but when Archeon comes over and kills a unit of them, then you can make Archeon attack himself and it's just such an amazing ability. But they're only movement five, so you can avoid them really easily. But then the corn player's job is to just to be using them to try to use that one ability. So it's amazing. It's it, 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 it's really cool, those little abilities. And again, all free to read on the app. So uh, And that's a, a kind of a great way for people to get into armies, I think. This edition sort of brought things in line to be a more of a streamlined game flow, I think. Something the, that happened, of course, 40K last year, where everything seems to kind of flow a little bit better than it did in the previous edition and i think just with the sheer effort they're putting behind the release and all this this push oh wait sorry are you talking about aos 2 yeah aos 2 yeah couldn't disagree more but sure okay let's let's talk about that then because to me i when i was playing aos a few weeks ago i found myself like uh kind of almost like kind of stopping and starting with my with my mindset and i've enjoyed the flow of aos 2 well this well there's just a lot more to do for aos 2 it's exactly the same game Apart from there's just more to do. So I don't know what, where was your, like, what was your stop gap before? Where were you falling down? I think that uh, it could be because I'm just so, uh, consumed with 40k that I felt like things like command points were now integral to my happiness and enjoyment. Oh, so, so, so it's a 40k dynamic switching over to Age of Sigmar as opposed to just Age of Sigmar itself, right? I think so. Yep. Yeah. Coming, okay. coming from that, uh, that mind space. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, maybe I could see so. I mean, the command ability, thing is is actually quite a big upheaval for people who already played sigma um and for 40k people i guess um is it's still very different to stratagems and it's used in different phases and i suppose the biggest maybe difference is that you do a lot of planning before you do movement in age of sigma with the hero phase but in 40k you do you do your movement so that you can enact your plan those are the, that that kind of leads me into the what I wanted to discuss with you today is the people that are coming into Age of Sigmar for potentially the first time, uh, or fighting perceptions or what have you from from the like the original release of it before the the General's Handbook started coming out is things like the hero phase and what we hear is the dreaded double turn. Okay, so yeah, I suppose I suppose double turn does sound scary, but I think the more realistic way to look at it is turn priority. Um, can we just can we discuss that a bit? Because and I mean like very much from the basics. Like when you how do you determine who goes first, and then how do you determine who goes second? Is not okay. the you go I go uh, that we that we know in 40k. Yeah. So unfortunately, unfortunately, still 
Um, and I did run a big poll on my Twitter actually, and we ended up with I don't know three or four hundred votes, and it was it ended up being something like seventy five percent of the people who voted wanted it to be uh, whoever finishes deploying go first gets plus one to a dice off to see who goes first, but. Um, that hasn't been updated for AOS 2. So it's the same as AOS 1 has always been, which whoever finishes deploying first chooses who goes first. And that is a massive tactical advantage. Um, and most people, and what we have in Age of Sigmar compared to 40k, is battalions. So um, effectively, it's an additional kind of it's formation that you pay points for, and it can include up to a certain amount of units and the most powerful are almost always one drop battalions so these are entire armies that you can drop in a single deployment meaning that unless your opponent has another one drop battalion and then it's a dice off to see who goes first um then it's uh it's it's your decision on who gets to go first yeah for instance uh there are war scroll battalions that have other battalions in them like the the uh dreadwood wargrove yep. that has an out which is a war scroll battalion that has the the basis of that is an outcast battalion which is a certain number of spy remnants or what have you yeah, three, and then if you take the Dreadwood, you have to include four. So sometimes there's always attacks, and obviously the really, the really, the really good ones usually include your battle line units, because in Age of Sigmar you have to have three battle line units, and you have to have a hero. Um, and That's then, the other it, thing I want to talk about after we talk about the double turn is sure. battle lines and and yeah. and how to kind of uh, make the most bang for your buck for that. Sorry, I'm just prefacing the the back half of this. That's okay. Absolutely. No, um, and I've got a little bit more time than I said, so we're, we're good for a bit. So the double turn, yeah, so that's that hasn't been updated for AOS 2. So if you are looking to build an army or, or design an army, um, then what you're going to want to do is look for an army that's got as few drops as possible. Actually, uh, three years into the game, um, people like myself, I played Brian Carmichael at the Heat, I actually um, I went, I took a, an 11 drop army and never decided who goes first. Uh, but my army was designed that my opponent almost always uh, would want me to go first um, so that they could potentially get what is the perceived dreaded double turn. But the double, <laughs> the, the double turn is instinctively instinctively only a 50% chance and it's actually lower now because in after both players have had their first turn so that's a battle round before deciding who goes first in the next battle round you roll you do a dice off and if I beat you I get to choose who goes first now I don't have to go next I choose and again that's a massive point to make and you should super focus on should I take this should I be? Am I in a strong position? Because, uh, as an example, uh, Mystic Shield, which now doesn't do what it once was, um, but Mystic Shield, which allows me to reroll saves of one, I cast it in my hero phase, or the first part of turn one. Then you take your turn, and let's say you attack that unit. Then I win the priority roll. Well, I think, well, actually, if I give that turn to you, I've still got that buff up. That's still working for me, yeah. And I don't have to cast it again. They might be outside of the range of my uh, wizard, and I'm not going to be able to make a movement before the hero phase. So actually, I'm going to give you the turn because I want to keep my buffs going in your turn, you know. So I've had that up for three turns now with no effect because it lasts till my next hero phase. I get so what you're it, saying, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, and let me tell you, the uh, the the turn priority mechanic is gold. It's glorious, because if you're not a great gamer, then what you do is you build an army, you go first, or you don't go first, you go, right, I've got a one-drop army, you give your opponent the first turn, you pray and hope that <laughs> you get a double turn. You still you have throw some models your... left, and then you go twice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you throw your models forward, and you go, yes! Right? And, and But the really, the, the gamers that have worked that system really well is they design armies that don't care about going first, or they want you to try to go first, or they, it, there's it's a whole chess game of cat and mouse and and this and that, and it's super fascinating and it's really tactical, especially when someone gets to choose. Do you find the best armies either play into the strategy of going first, like a one drop army, or just say forget it and I'm going to have 47 drops in my army, and and that's one of the ways I'm winning games. Well, it, almost always, the, 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 some of the best competing armies uh, are Alpha Strike one drop lists. They almost always do very well. Um, you know, Fair. Uh, although, although in AOS 2, many of them, many of them are going to struggle a little bit. Um, because, well, because some of them have been nerfed quite hard. <laughs> Point, but points, increases of things and, uh, exactly, and but there will be. Way. 
but there will be other versions. For instance, the one you mentioned earlier, the Dreadwood Wargrove, it is will be a strong Alpha Strike one drop army. Um, so they're already going to exist in the game, and it's something to be aware of. But realistically, the people that want to, the, the definition of an Alpha Strike is that you cripple your opponent's ability to respond, and you win in that first attack. Right? That's basically what it means. I'm so you just designed them right now, by the way. All oh, right, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, uh, and the reason I brought up me going to the heat and uh, Brian, who I played as well, he had a mixed order army. I had a Seraphon army. Both of us wanted to play Alpha Strike in first turn armies because we wanted you to to try to do that because we win you on the eat and beat. We win you on going second. Mm-hmm. Um, win you. That's terrible English, isn't it? Beat you. Um, <laughs> so it's 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 an amazing when it comes to list design it's an integral part of the list design um and you will hear some people say things like yeah i didn't get the priority roll i lost if you're in a position where you have to get the priority roll to win then maybe you didn't play well enough in the turn before okay does that, does that make sense no uh, yeah absolutely because you, i mean you do get to it, now let's back it up a little bit you mentioned the the strategy around like the hero phase uh, and then it comes before movement, and that's something that, uh, like, you do all your spell casting in the hero phase. You do some other things Command in abilities. the hero phase. Can, can, like, there's a bunch of stuff. Could you explain a little bit of that and why, and 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 how that overlaps with the potential to defer the second or the the double turn and what have you, and uh, you know, the, just that kind of concept. I, I I don't want that to be too glossed over because it's a big thing. Because, um, like we, I think on the 40k side, we become accustomed to. Well, I'm just going to be able to move into range and do what I want. I'm going to exist outside of the, your threat range and then move into th- my own threat range and do something. Well, the hero phase that happens before movement. Now, there are things in there that could create movement and what have you, but it's still a, a, a big strategic moment for everyone every turn. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's So, like, the, the, the old thing, and it's still true in this case, as an example, would be Inspire and Presence, which would mean, uh, which is a command ability that was a generic one. It would allow you to pick a unit and they'd be immune to morale checks or leadership checks or battleshot phase, whatever game system you play. It's the same thing, right? Um, that was massive because you win the priority role, you look at the board and you think, oh, no, my general's nowhere near the unit that I need to be immune to battleshot next turn. <laughs> I played badly the turn before, but you think well, actually, if I give it to my opponent, um, they're still immune to battle shock, and their job, I assume, if they're immune to battle shock, will be to hold up whatever unit they're fighting. Um, uh, and obviously, that unit can elect to retreat, but then it can't charge. It can't, you know. So there's a, there's a fascinating play. So uh, in your first hero phase of the first hero phase, you have to plan what you might do in your second turn's hero phase, not knowing whether or not you're going to get to take it or not take it. Hmm. Yeah. So this is this is more complex than than because this is essentially the same when when it was a four page rules design. Now we're up to a twelve page rules design or whatever. But there's still some complexities that I think got lost uh, in that brief rules document. Oh, to people that didn't play, not not to you and people that have been playing, but to people that were they kind of glossed over it as a as what may they they might have thought was a simple game. Well, it's uh, and and (laughs) and it's. And it's amazing, I promise you, because once you get once you get into it, you'll find the you go I go forty k, which I love. By the way, I'm currently sat talking to you, playing up ball greens, I'm going to the heat next weekend. <laughs> um, it's too static. It's not uh, um, alive enough in a lot of ways uh, on the tabletop because uh, the, the 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 priority role it becomes. It becomes it becomes a big deciding factor sometimes of who wins and who doesn't. Definitely, but well, also well, as the games get more mature, and I mean, like after they've been out, the battle tomes have been edited or codexes in the case of 40k. Uh, as it gets more mature, you can it's it's also becomes what I've seen typically a little bit more predictable. This element makes games not predictable. I mean, unless you really do have that sweet strategy of not of never caring uh, what the priority is. And what it does, and what it does is a big switch up from Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which was you go, I go, and from 40k as well. And you can see people who've come from a 40k environment, they build gun lines, right? That's who they are. Yeah, they... <laughs> Because <laughs> I've, I've, I've met some ex 40k players, they're like, I've got this, and I'm like, that's a gun line, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
and but the Look, problem with the gun line is people way over there before they ever get to you. So, you know, sometimes that's fine. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the problem with the gun line is is what happens is you there will more than guaranteed be a couple of Iron Jaws players because they generally are just ignorant of everything other than beating your face in. And what they'll do is they'll run their entire army forward and they'll stay you in the eyeballs and they just roll a dice. You know, and fifty percent of the time <laughs> they're going to beat you and then they're going to kick your face in and. And that's something you have to be... But there's so many changes for AOS 2 come in that's really important. Biggest one is that the scenarios have been the defining factor for Age of Sigma. They are... If anyone... If, you know, oh, there's these guys who won't stop playing Age of Sigma, they seem to love it. It's the scenarios. Compared to 40k scenarios out of chapter approved, which are generally trash, um, in my opinion, for, like, for having fun with your opponent, I mean, in their kind of like playability, the scenarios are always been really fun, really interesting. Usually Usually all six over a, over a, a case of a tournament. There's always been six in General's Handbooks, and before the General's Handbook, when Mo did it, there was all six um, uh, scenarios. They and, would and all. These balance. are typically the scenarios that make their way into the grand tournaments as well. Like they just they're the only ones. Age of Sigmar. Age, of, Age of Sigmar is played uncomped always everywhere. We just yeah, don't do comp, with the exception of the, the the first major Age of Sigmar tournament happening in the UK is actually initiating the first piece of Age of Sigmar comp that I know of, which is a roll off for the first turn. Um, so you know, out of the book, when you're playing with your friends, it's always going to be that way. I just thought I'd mention it because it's very yeah. interesting that the the Age of Sigmar community, as a, as, a, as a group, has said this is some uh, competitive community. Sorry, has said this is something that I think we needs to be addressed, and I'm sure. Um, and it was addressed in 40k, right? Oh well, yeah, it was. Yeah, that that's what you know. We've been you know, kind of talking in chats and stuff. People and things like it's probably going to move this way. And I'm like, well, you never know because plenty of opportunities to have made it that way in the book. You know, this is probably absolute intent. You know, yeah, uh, which is fine. You know, uh, but and again, you can you can prepare for it. You can build lists around it. You can it's it's. But don't think of it as it, it's nothing to fear, and it's everything to be gained from it. I, I give you a really good example. Imagine you take an army and you push super hard, right? So if you want a bit of gamesmanship, you push super hard into the middle of the board and you say, I'm going to double turn you, right? <laughs> yeah? Then your opponent wins the turn, let's say, right? He then goes, no matter what, he's going to jump on me this turn. He panics. He makes some decisions that he maybe shouldn't have done. Maybe he should have been more subtle, yeah? Maybe, you know, like, maybe he goes in when you want him to go in, and maybe he doesn't go in and he retreats a bit, and that's all you wanted. And then you back up into the middle of the board where all the objectives are. <laughs> there's, there's so much you can do with it in, in, in terms of just having fun with your opponent and playing chess. It's a brilliant and beautiful dynamic. And sometimes it's just awful when, when someone's got a list that's just so offensive in its, its output, which has happened with like Carriage on Overlords as an example with the clown car. Um, you know, from and that, the that original like, transport for Age of Sigmar. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Which has been, which is, which, which is just a bad piece of game design, realistically. Um, and some factions can't take one-drop armies, so they don't see the light of day as much as other armies, so they don't get to play that game uh, generally. But, yeah, honestly, there's well, nothing Well, when you're to playing with your buddies, I mean, you can you can do whatever you want. When you're playing in tournaments, that's a different thing altogether. You're going to – you have to – you should be focused on taking lists that are competitive or understand what's going to happen if you don't. Yeah, I, I, agreed. It's the understanding, but I promise you, and it's it maybe it will feel alien for a while, but once you get into it, my moment was when I was playing a very long time ago now at a tournament, um, and I was playing a gentleman from uh, called Terry Pike, a lovely man, um, and he had a pretty obnoxious Nurgle sort of demon force, and I had a Lizardman force, and I looked at his army, and it was faster than mine. It had better range than mine. It had more offensive, like, power than mine, guaranteed. And if we were to play, you go, I go, and if I was to be, like, if I was to sacrifice piece for piece, I was losing that game, I thought, in my head, nine times out of ten. I just, he just, he just had, had better units that could, that were more mobile was the main issue for my army. Mm. Um, mine was more of a castle. And I needed to go, and it was, I needed to go to his objective, which is where he was. So I was just going to lose all of my models on the way. So I just looked at him, and like, I, he, he set up his first turn, super cagey, built his little wall. He's like, I'm going to just jump ahead of that. And I was like, well then, I'll just throw all my models forward. And I just ran my whole army. <laughs> I just ran it all. I just ran it all. And I thought, well, because I'm, I'm five turns ahead, right? I'm five turns ahead, and I've lost the game. So 
But now the priority role gives me the opportunity to make it a game. To make it happen, right? To make it a game. So I just run my whole army forward, and I look him in the face, and I say, Terry, if I get this, I'm just going to run into your army. And I rolled the dice, and I won the priority roll, ran into his army. It was still a close fight, but it was a fight, as opposed to I just am going to lose. What a glorious day. <laughs> yeah, and, and from that point on, I'm like, this is the only thing that matters about this game. It's brilliant. Um, and I would love them for them to find a way to pour into 40k. Probably there's too much offensive firepower, like shooting, in 40k for that to be true. I don't know, but it's you're going to have a ball, I promise. Once you get to grips with it and start to use it, are you excited about it? And that's, it. It? that's actually, we got like three turns into the game when we aren't in the first test. And we're like, wait, we haven't been doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but because, you not, you know, it's just because we're just so used to doing it the other way. But, you know, but we also didn't, you know, we didn't really think about that and the list set up and that kind of stuff. But it adds just this whole other level layer to the game. I, I do think it's going to be fun. Uh, absolutely. Don't, and when you build your list, don't say, well, then if I get the double turn, I win. Find a way to say, and then my opponent will get the double turn, and I'll win. <laughs> I, I will. I will do that. That would be my, uh, my mantra. Because, because, because people will be super excited about trying to get it, and that's the trap. So you can just like kick the legs out from under them? Yeah, the, you know, see, see that the, that the, that, uh, that blank, uh, pale look come over their face. <laughs> well, there's nothing more fun when they they and and you'll see it as well. Like you know, if you if they've given you the first turn, right? You know, and then they're having their turn. You've got an entire turn to watch what they're doing and plan for what happens when you get the priority roll. Are you going to take it? Are they making the right decisions? Okay, yeah, they've they've taken that they've taken that unit on the left, but was that really a big deal? Like, can you afford to lose another unit? And then you look at it and you look through and you roll. Same way, your opponent might be only going half in on their first turn, planning to go all in on second turn, you know, but wanting you to give them the turn. You don't know what's happening, and that's the fun. I like it. I think I think it'd be great that if you know once I get a few built list building. Uh, exercises under my belt and see what some other people are having. I'd love to kind of explore this concept with you uh, again a little, uh, you know, in the future. Uh, I'd love to. Especially love to. Get a few, few weeks into the release. Yeah, it's it's really, really fun. I promise. Battle line. You mentioned that battle line troops have to be included no matter what, even if you're taking formations or, or uh, War Scroll Battalions or not. Um, so uh, there's a chart of how many of what you have to take. It's not a four sword chart, as it were, but if you're playing, there's a, the chart says if you're playing X amount of points, then you've got to have these things in your army. So yeah, there's 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 probably like a few things to mention with battle line. So if you're playing a, a tournament level, um, I think it's I can't remember what it's called, but you, you're taking two thousand points, which means you have to have three battle line units. And there are three types of battle line units that you can have in the game. There is generic battle line. So there are four factions. So there's chaos, death, uh, destruction, and order. And in them, in the different factions, some will just say on in the general's handbook, they'll say battle line, which means they're generic battle line for the whole of order, which means if you were to take a mixed order list, which would mean that you weren't a Sylvaneth army or you weren't a Deepkin army, you would be able to use those as uh, your battle line units, of which you need three. And that's okay. You can have an order army. 100%. Mixed okay. order is one of the strongest armies in the game. Okay. And also destruction. Uh, I mean, we're not, we're just using order because it's, it's no, destruction. Right? Mixed destruction is not yeah. the strongest in the game anymore. Poor destruction. <laughs> well, I'm saying you could, anyone could do it. Like if you were to have a fact, you want to be the bad guys, you could just do that and have a, have yeah, a exactly. Order. Especially, and especially for, and for narrative, um, uh, it, it's one of my favorite things. It's absolutely amazing. Um, they're, they're even rarer now in AOS 2 than they were in AOS 1. Um, but you get to theme entire amazing armies around these units. You can tell whole great stories. My uh, order army is all Sylvaneth themed, even though it's got Stormcast in and it's got Hurricanums in and it's got it's got a variety of units in that aren't Sylvaneth, but I've stuck tree bits on them or put dryad heads on them or Tree Lord Ancients are carrying around Celestial Hurricane and bits, all sorts of Those stuff. kids are so versatile. They, they, all the Sylvaneth kits come with... Now, I'm a Sylvaneth player, that's why I, I bring them up a lot, but uh, just that they come with so many parts in the kit that you can use for other things. Like, hey, you need a branch witch you didn't have before? Well, you probably got bits to make one out of your out of your shake box, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's a great kit, but it's it's lovely, and it really helps you, like... 
take allied armies and stuff. Anyway, so it's that, that's really cool. But that's battle line. Then the most common battle line that you'll experience is you'll go into a shop and you want to buy a battle tome. Uh, let's pick. I don't know who I'll pick. Let's just pick. Uh, let's pick Iron Jaws. Iron, Iron Jaws, Jaws are sounds good. Iron Jaws is fun because they look cool. So you pick Iron Jaws. So um, uh, Ard Boys are your battle line um, in that. If you have uh, Iron Jaws Allegiance, so that means that it's like a battle forged army if you're talking about 40k. So effectively everyone's got the keyword Iron Jaws in that army. Then you get battle line if units. So that is battle line if you have this allegiance. Uh, so that would be Gore Grunters and Brutes. So that means you no longer have to take Hard Boys, and you can kind of upgrade from having uh, your stock troops to your elite troops as your battle line units. It's a different level of commitment. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's it's kind of like playing First Company, like Space Marines, right? Um, so you can you can really mix it up um, in that, and that's great because usually because of allegiance abilities and how that works, you're always taking almost always an allegiance to that whichever battle tome you, you you're normally going for that because it's got spells and it's got artifacts and it's got other and things. And you stack you... up abilities, yeah. There's command abilities, there's artifacts, there's uh, there's artifacts for wizards, there's artifacts for for weapon type artifacts that you can put on wizards if they have the right keywords. Uh, if if I read that correctly. Uh, and then there are uh, battalion abilities. And I know it sounds like and this and this and this and this, but I think the game very much does uh, rely on these type of uh, stacked abilities. Layer, I shouldn't say stacked, layered abilities for uh, for uh, composing your army with. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, and, and, and this is what I meant at the top of the show when we were just talking. There's, there's a, there's a very, there's a very wide complexity, but there's also a very deep complexity to Age of Sigmar. Um, which, but even before AOS 2 occurred, now with AOS 2, with summoning, um, with command abilities, um, uh, there's going to be even more, uh, there's even more to add on. And then being from a certain realm, there's going to be more to put on top of that. So there's there's a lot to, uh, when it comes to the list building stage, um, being realistic. Um, but, you know, there's there's loads of people out there that, like myself, that are trying to help people out with that. Anyway, uh, so you've got battle line generic. You've got battle line if. Um, did I say there were three? I think you may have even said four, yeah. but I know uh, it's there, two. And then you've also got you've also got you've also got battle line if you have a certain type of general. Yep. Okay. Yep. Three. Yep. Yeah. So um, and then that's the same thing. If you have a particular general, you can use other units as battle line, and it says it all in the general's handbook to the right hand side. So you've got the points, and to the right hand side, and it will tell you what they are. So. There you go. So these, but this is this is it. It's a it's all about how deep you want to go with certain factions, which you want to layer up. Like for instance, the deep kin. If you take uh, the the one of the kings, one of the guys in the seahorses, then the guys that ride the eels. And I know I'm being very basic with the units, but I'm just again, this is completely intro type show. Uh, then those guys become troops as we know them, or battle line uh, as that is known in Age of Sigmar. Yes, exactly right. And nothing gets around taking battle line forces. So in a 2,000 point army, you have to take that X amount of battle line forces. Exactly. Uh, that's that's effectively like, it's, it, and it's really important in loads of different ways because it, it, it limits armies in a big way, um, which is great. Um, and it pigeonholes armies into using certain units, which is really important. It also means everyone has to pay attacks which is good, and some people invest heavily in attacks. For instance, like, I still to this day think Plague Bearers are the best, one of the best battle units in the game. Oh, they absolutely Skins. are. That's just such a strong army with the with the fact that they get all these little speed buffs and stuff. I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, Movement I mean, 17 Plague Bearers. Uh, yeah, I mean, you'd think that they... I mean, uh, in, my, in everyone's mind that they are slow and tanky, but <laughs> with the right with the right layers of rules... They're fast and tanky. Yeah, they... <laughs> they're definitely tanky, but they're now they're fast and tanky. <laughs> they're, they're like prize fighting boxers, is what they are. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense, I won't lie to you, when you've got Plague Bearers moving 17 inches and then you've got a Tree Lord Ancient with his massive legs moving five. I'm going to sum it up for you. Yeah. Uh, Nurgle likes to dance. <laughs> and I'm fine with that. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, like, and, and you kind of do two things with the battle line, just like everyone, right? Just like 40k. You either invest in your battle line, and you want to make them better. So you're taking all your Plague Bearers, so you probably take a great unclean one, because his command ability is going to be able to affect those demon Plague Bearers. That's great. Or you're going along the route of going for Chaos Marauders or Skinks, um, because, and you're taking minimum units of those, because even taking a maximum unit of those, they don't do much. 
or maybe they're not particularly I, I don't think that all troops, and, and let me know if this is the case for battle line, like in 40k, not all troops are created equal. Uh, uh, yes. And, and that's yeah. always been kind of like a, a sticking point for me in systems that, that uh, force you to take X amount of troop choices. Like 400 points of Eldar Guardians is not the same as 400 points of Space Marines. And, you know, <laughs> you put that across to, to, to all factions. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can be you, you, absolutely. So again, it's about learning what what those battle line units you have because they do define the army to a huge degree. And previously in Age of Sigmar, it would also be the commandability you had. As an example, free peoples, which is your humans and empire of old, they have got a variety of units that can do a bunch of things. And you and you almost look at the the halberdiers and the militia and you think, and the great swords and you think, okay, I'm going to charge these guys up the field and start beating people up. And if I get charged then that's fine. But their commandability is, if they stay still, they get plus one to hit, they get plus one save. And it's a bubble. So you can basically make a defensive okay. gun line. And they've got some good shooting units. And, now you, and, and that's the only commandability they have access to. So now you go, okay, I've got these battle line units, but the only commandability I have access to is stand and shoot. So this is now a stand and shoot army. That's what I'm playing. <laughs> so it, it, while the battle line is important, the commandabilities the army has access to are as important. Uh, really, and you're talking really. about like their uh, their battle tome entry command abilities. So, so each character, each character on their war scroll or their data sheet has um, a, a, well, they have their own special abilities, but they have a command ability that you can use. Previously, it was your general only could use it. Now it's any character with a command ability can use it. You spend a command point to use that ability. Your general can use that ability at a range of 12 inches, usually. Um, but sometimes, I mean, the commandability, sometimes, let's say, pick a unit in 18 inches and add plus one attack, as an example. So you would use that as the range. The command um, points refresh every round. And yeah, is that on your turn? Like, so when you, yeah. get your, when you start to go, your command points refresh? Yes, you get what you get one back. Mm-hmm. You, or you get one. You also get one for every War Scroll Battalion that you take. That's at the start and, of the game. That's, that's at the start of the game. And they don't and go away, it. though. You can save them. Yes, they're just, it's a pool, right? It's, a, it's an increasing pool that you have, um, effectively. Uh, so yeah, so the, the, the battle line and its interaction with the command abilities are instinctively important, realistically. So you can't really mention one without the other because, you know, while your battle line might seem that they can do something great, if your command ability says that they can't do anything great. <laughs> 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 it looks somewhere else for that power. <laughs> so you'll, that's that's maybe one of the reasons that you you do you do build your army in a certain way to take advantage of these uh, of these because like p- people are used to it now. I think of X character buffs either a certain unit or a certain thing around them, and that happens a lot in Age of Sigmar. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that that forty uh, k is more prevalent with the auras. We don't tend to have lots of auras more now that we've had previously, but normally it would be like abilities are either on or off. Um, a command ability is on a thing or off a thing. And then some units would, but just beyond characters, some units would just generally uh, have aura abilities around them. Um, and then there's a distinction between aura abilities and I forget the other term. We, what did we call it? Spark abilities. So that would be an aura ability is constantly everything within range gets X. Spark ability would be I activate it, all all units within X are blessed, and now they can carry on to their heart's desire to wherever they wish to travel with said ability until it, it says that it ends. That sounds that nice. Mean, yeah. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds awfully pleasant. <laughs> Go forth and multiply, or, or divide, in fact. And divide those forces in half, yeah. Uh, I know we're, we're getting close to your, your time limit here where, where you have to go and do your own show. So if you wouldn't mind, I do have a couple things I want to ask you while you still have you, but uh, go ahead and let's talk about where people can find more of your banter about all things Wargaming. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's the Honest Wargamer. Uh, so we're on Twitch. We, we've got a podcast on iTunes and obviously SoundCloud um, and Twitter, Facebook, just anywhere. Just type us in. Twitch is where we go live. Age of Sigma, we talk about it on Mondays uh, in the UK, 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. UK time. But and then Tuesdays, I take general questions and list questions and stuff. And we've got a Discord channel you can join as well. So loads. There's loads. And, and Age of Sigma is like, I'm super into 40k as well. Um, but Age of Sigma is like something that I play a lot and have played a lot um and it's something i'm super invested in it's good you jam so. on the hobby i mean you, you, i mean you're talking about you're painting models you actually do you go through a lot of uh of effort to make sure that you've got hard as nails list that are pleasing to look out on the table and you're you know you you don't leave the sportsmanship behind either i mean that's 
it's it, it, it's actually and that's in, and that again that's Age of Sigma. Like I suppose really in 40k you have that conversation about being that guy or or you know there's loads of conversations that occur on the tabletop right um, and off the tabletop about exactly the 40k game. Age Sigma community has always been for a long time a really self policing great community. Um, that's encouraging. That's good to know. Yeah, and it, it, in a big way, mainly because Games Workshop wasn't involved with it at the start. Um, truth be told, uh, now that they are, and some of those, like some, of the, and this is not like a, this is not a, a, a negative. This is just a truthful kind of statement. Now that they are, and they're reclaiming ownership of their game, there may be a silly few months ahead of us, uh, but because. While there's the 40k community are really solid at breaking the game pretty quick, <laughs> uh, immediately. Uh, this isn't this isn't a new addition to us. This is effectively the same game. We've got all the tricks and skills that we already had. Um, they've just given us more tools to add more tricks and skills. So uh, those those pro age of Sigma players are going to be, and I don't consider myself to be one of them. I, I just consider myself to be appreciative of those guys, um, and uh, they're going to be ripping this up. It's going to be terrifying. Well, Thousands well, of well, points to reward, you, all sorts. Summoning that's yeah. a big change in the game. Well, how do you feel about that? I know that I summoned about thirty dryads last night. Ah, uh, well. It. I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. So, so again, like Battle Line, not all summoning is made equal, right? So you got to ask yourself. Inherently, I don't think whether or not it's workload or skill, the the rules writers and the dev team will have put out a fair and balanced game. Be aware of that before you go into Age of Sigma. And the same is true for 40k. And anyone who says that it's not is just wrong. Like, like I, I give you all the stats in the world and row with you till the end of the time because you're not right. Yeah, it's not a fair and balanced game. And once you know that, that's fine. Yeah, as long as you're, like, I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with that thoughts. And, and off I go into the world of Age of Sigma and Age of Sigma too. And people are going to put, they're going to dump. I mean, like, I don't know. I can dump an extra 600 points on the board a turn. Like. I, all that's going to do, my, so whether or not it's balanced or fair, right? Which I assume it's not going to be, because why would it be? It seems insane. Because Army X, for instance, my friend's Iron Jaws Army can put no extra points on the board, and I can put six hundred points extra on the board every turn. I don't really know how that works out balanced. And do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I think that the ways to uh, balance most games, uh, like this anyway, are through point levels and uh, and mission design. That's that's my approach to 40k. Stand by it, and it works when applied in that way. Uh, but but this is this is fresh, and I think the idea is that some of the things in the in the new version of the game have had point adjustments to compensate for some of that. Now, because there's also you don't just get to do it in most cases. You've got to either earn it um, or cast a spell or something. I mean, there's I mean. Th- I'm not saying all earning them are equal or, or, or that I have done the analysis on every level of how it's done, but I do know that uh, th- th- at least the idea is that the points on the figures and the models themselves have been somewhat uh, manipulated to adjust for that potential. Yeah, and that's and 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 having already looked through all of the general's handbooks points um, and already applied that to to quite a few situations, I've done nothing actually, Paul, for about a week and a half apart from this because that's I don't do, I don't turn the show on and just talk. The the point of what I <laughs> the point of what I do is is I assume that some of the best agency my players in the world are listening, and so I try not to be a, a, an idiot when I talk about it. Yeah. Um, solid practice. I'm gonna, solid I'm going to try that for 40k. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, and and that's not true. It's not right. Like they're not close. Um, but that's fine. <laughs> that doesn't matter because you can just double turn those. <laughs> Apologize for swearing. Apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you could just double turn them, or, or, or you can outplay them. And, uh, and, I just need um, two solid rounds in a row of shooting them with the Colonel Hunters. And the, yeah, apart from the M4s, right? That's things the big to kill deal. themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so. Uh, but the big problem for me with summoning, although I think as a mechanic it's cool, don't get me wrong, the big problem for me with summoning is slowing the game down. Sure. Okay. Now that I think that's very valid. Anytime that you have, anytime you're uh, uh, <clears throat> putting more things on the table, potentially taking things out of foam or a bag or whatever, those minutes do add up, and that's that's not insignificant. And and then you're adding more things to move on the table in subsequent turns. 
Time, exactly. time is an issue. Time's an issue. Like an Eight Sigma generally is a pretty fast paced game and you'll finish most games, which is great. And that there's I don't have that as a problem. Um up until now, I think you can put a huge amount of, of bodies on the board in some cases. But then the then some of it may not be where the power for armies lie and it may lay the other way in that it's just command ability stacking and you basically can just nuke an army in a turn. Um, so there's loads, there's loads to learn, and I honestly don't know. Um, there's no fear mongering from me. Uh, these are all potentials, right? And they're all potentially wrong as answers. Well, these uh, are the things to at least consider because when you're going, because we're talking about for competitive play at a tournament where you have two and a half hour, three hour rounds, and the game simply must have a natural conclusion between then, or people don't feel good. Yes, absolutely. So that's that's my worry with summoning. Uh, truth be told. Um, but uh, again, I'm, I'm, see, I'm very excited to just use it. Uh, this is my playground, right? This is where I, I, I was playing against the Zinch army, by the way. So they're right. dumping, they're dumping blue horrors on the table as fast as I'm dumping, uh, dryads. More, actually, they're dumping faster, <laughs> truth be told, uh, because I'm, I'm murder facing pink horrors. And I, I don't know, man, it just seemed, it seemed good. All right, that's that's uh, it, because <laughs> it's because you it's because you're playing such a sweet, lovely game. Like <laughs> well, maybe that's, that be, that's like me saying, "Oh, do you know what I did, uh, Charlie Boy? I just just rolled some rhinos around, and I just had a great time. And I was, uh, you know, I stuck a plasma <laughs> uh, gun on top of it. You know, a molten plasma. And you're like, why have you done that? What's your? You can't do that on um, you can't do that on chaos rhinos, right? Um, <laughs> y- you can do some crazy, sh- okay? And everyone tells you can't do some crazy. Sh- wrong but that doesn't mean you shouldn't go and have a good time i'm super on board with that uh super on board uh- <laughs> well i guess that i'm i'm hopeful of how this all plays out and then how again how missions and and maybe point limits at the tournaments i can already tell you how it's going to turn things. out um, it's going to turn out fantastic yeah like oh don't like we've been we've been like self-policing and wrecking this game for three years it's a it's a ball it's so much fun. Like, what's great about the Sigma community is someone goes, I'm doing this. And everyone goes, did you just do that? It's like, yeah. I go, that's amazing. They shouldn't let's do that. It's like, I agree. Let's talk to someone. Let's all talk to someone. <laughs> it's stupid. Right? <laughs> There's none of that. There's none of that, like, why are you doing this? Why are you being that guy? It's all like, that is clever. Let's talk to someone. This is too far. Yeah, let's stop doing this. This is a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the the was it cheeky like you guys say in the uh, in the truest sense of the form word? Oh, really cheeky! Ah, oh, some of the stuff is um, it, it is going to be just bananas cool. Um, assassins popping out of like other guys that can teleport and just turn what? off magic items. Iron jaws, um, grots that can do sixteen damage a turn. So you got a grot, a one goblin who can kill Archeon. Well, no yeah. <laughs> he must get up very early in the morning. <laughs> he's just been doing, well, the, the issue is, is he's got another 40 lads in his squad who could do the same thing. That's the real <laughs> drama. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Enthusiasm's high for this game. And I mean, it's time. I know you, um, we, we talked about some things uh, to be critical of, but you can tell in your voice the enthusiasm is there for this game. Oh, because, because, because what they've done, um, realistically whether it by intent or by accident is they've just added so much to the game yeah there's just so much out there that the permutations are almost impossible to calculate so there's just going to be stuff all of us are just going to be like oh, i don't know what that does let's let's find out i don't know if i'm taking palisades the endless spells is another huge addition uh to the game uh, in loads of different ways, from like attacking and defending to a variety can take of them. stuff. And one of the oldest lists in Age of Sigma is now back, and it's the worst, most obnoxious, most terrible list to ever play against and play with. That's back. That's been FAQ. It's oh. just like which one is this? Up. I need to take some notes here. <laughs> this, this is cool. this, so so previous. So before GHBs came out, um, there was the Croak Banner. Oh which is, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, no. So since since many moons ago since croak was in the game um well so croak was a competitive choice he effectively fell out of favor after the croak banner and then it got then we had the bellwind vortex be a thing that just started to happen and then, and then the croak nado occur, occurred where you would summon a bellwind vortex and a slan called lord croak would sit atop it and he would just mortal wound everyone it was pretty good um but he was only able to cast it and had been since basically the inception of the game only cast the spell that's on his war scroll the one time mm-hmm. um now that young gentleman can has had that restriction lifted off him 
Um, which is weird because he was always pointed for being able to do the, th- the spell three times, but now not. Um, <laughs> and then there's this thing called an Astroloth Banner Bearer who adds plus eight inches to his range and also adds plus one to cast. So basically what you can deploy is three Astroloth Banner Bearers and Lord Croak. I mean, you can take five if you want to, but three's fine. And then all he does is he sits on his objective or just sits at the back of the board and then he rolls two dice and it's a casting value of five. He's also got re-rolls as his own command ability. Um, and then you cast it on a five, then you cast it on a six, and then you cast it on a seven because of the Astroloth Banner Bearers. And then what you do is you roll 3d6 and you add 24 inches to the range of that and then every model every unit inside of that range takes d3 mortal wounds and you oh. do that three times so imagine every unit in your army before you start having a turn taking 3d3 mortal wounds <laughs> that, that, sound uh, that, sound, that sounds bad yeah your pink horror sounds so cute in comparison <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But that won't be around for long. Like, there's no reason that made a comeback. Like, none that I, anyone could see. Uh, but that's fine. It doesn't matter. Someone will do it, and everyone will just be like, don't do that. You're being a knob. Yeah, and everyone will be like, yeah, I won't do that. I'm sorry. It's just... <laughs> but it sounds so fun. <laughs> it isn't. I, I, nah. I played against it in Wales, like, three years ago. Um, <laughs> it's not. Uh... <laughs> well, this is the kind of stuff I'm looking forward to. Though, oh, wait, sorry. Because... Unless you're a demon. But you're oh, not, yeah? your friend would have taken D6 mortal wounds three oh, times. Oh, man. 3D6 mortal wounds. Oh, well, he deserves it. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's a great guy. <laughs> uh, he's the guy that I, I test competitively with. And so we are. We are. Like, we're staring at each other trying to find just the most obnoxious things we can do with each other. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, go. Uh, well, so with with, uh, with with this in mind, I mean, this is one of the most great, the greatest things about. Like, I just ran a tournament. I've talked about it a lot on the show, so I won't rehash it here. But it it, it had uh, like thirty eight unique lists or something there. Yeah, that were not copies of each other. You didn't see a lot of duplication uh, <laughs> of list concepts. And I and that this is deep into forty k, right? I mean, I think we're just going to see the same thing with Sigmar. You're going to be able to play. Um, Things that you might just sound interesting. On the most part, yeah. I like um, the scenarios again, and I did talk about that. The scenarios are such, and even the new scenarios, which uh, they do something which I I'm not a fan of, which is a lot of the scenarios mean that you're now you can deploy basically 18 inches apart as opposed to 24, mm-hmm. um, which I'm not a big fan of because that they work super hard on already removing the movement phase, which is my favorite phase because I think that's the tactical phase. Oh, from the game. A lot can get done. And then when you combine it with the hero phase, I mean, I'm telling you, I think that's, those are two, uh, there, there are no blanks in the game. There aren't, let's just hurry up and get this out of the way. You can, you can really do some, some work in each of the phases. Yeah. And, and, and you want to feel like you won the game, right? As opposed to just saying, I do this thing, I win the game. That that can't that can't be fun for anyone really. I don't think um, even the person playing with it. So, uh, but you know, with the exception of that, the scenarios seem really fun, interesting, difficult to achieve. One of my favourite scenarios from the previous uh, edition was Knife to the Heart, which almost everyone hated universally <laughs> because it's just an objective in your corner, an objective in my corner, and unless you own both objectives, you don't you can't get a major win. And and that's like, simply draw fest in in 40k. Yeah, and, and so many of the competitive players would just sit and just try and rack up a few a few kill points so that they would get a minor victory, and guaranteed they'd be like, right, I'll get the minor victory and I'll try and go forward. But then someone, some lunatic out there, yeah. Or just not even that. Just typically, you see my players would go, "I'm not having that. I'm coming over there to beat you up, right?" And they would make it. <laughs> they would make it a game. And then your issue is, is when you play conservatively in this game, sometimes that just bites you in the like, and you have to worry about like players that don't play conservatively because the the priority role mechanic means that playing conservatively often leads to your downfall because you can't guarantee what's going to happen so you have to you have to strategize loss and you have to strategize uh engagement or retreating so that was a really telling scenario for people who won or lost it because you can often point out the fact that and sometimes it was to do with army composition or a lot of the time but sometimes you could just to do with their attitude and how they wanted to go forward with that game that's pretty cool, man. And let me revise my statement from the beginning of that. You can play whatever you want you think is cool uh, if you're not trying to go for these one-drop battalions. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like, and, and, and arguably, but the battalions give you, 
so much. They give you an artifact of power, extra, because everyone can take one. And for every War Scroll Battalion you include in your army, you can add another one. Not onto the same character, a, a, and a named character can never take one, but a generic character can take one. So if you've got two War Scroll Battalions and three generic characters, that's three arcane, uh, three artifacts of power you can take. And, and, you'll also and you can take them, you know, from, I mean, and they are, they're good. They're, they're things that plus one to cast or plus two in certain situations, extra saves. I mean, game defining in some cases. Yeah. In some cases, they are the reason some people will take an army. Or they'll build their army around that artifact of power. And everyone has these. Everyone has these. In the, if you have a battle tome, you've got artifacts of power. Yeah, or there, and there are generic artifacts of power if you go for mixed destruction or mixed well, death. Or mixed say, also, in Malign Sorcery, there are spells and artifacts of power in there. Yeah, they are. Are they match play, though? Uh, spells are, are artifacts. I, I assume that they, they will be if people want them to be. Oh, yeah, artifacts are um, yeah, artifacts are a thingy, aren't they? Uh, the realms. Yeah, the realm of shadow is the one. By the way, everyone, if you're a if you're a really aggressive player, realm of shadow. Five of the six weapons are amazing, but if you're a really like defensive player, please may I suggest the realm of light or the realm of life. Uh, there's a cape that uh, you can put on a cape. doppelganger cape. Okay. The you know, one that gives him plus four movement and flying. Yeah, doppelganger. So, um, so it's the um, what's it called? It's something something uh, thermal something cape or cloak or something. Oh yeah, another one from fire. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so put a flaming cloak on a tree man, and that's just party time. That's just a mistake, isn't it, though, really? That's just going to go... <laughs> he's, you think about it, this is going to be... He's, he's made some poor life choices. He's only going to be moved at nine, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, look, this is what I think is fun. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And also, I want to see that painted up and modeled, right? That's going to look amazing. Yeah? <laughs> that's going to be really, really fun. Uh, well, so, you know I'm saying? That there's, uh, you don't have to... Um, like there are options like you there there are lots of things that you can choose from uh, in this game which uh, we've only barely began to scratch the surface with well exactly that that's just what I, I meant if you go to the realm of shadow there are five out of six artifacts of power that are weapons which are great at killing stuff there's one that does d6 mortal wounds on every six to hit that's amazing and you can add pluses to your hit so you can have mega bosses doing they've got six attacks if they want they can be up to seven or eight attacks and they can be hitting on four they could be doing more d6 more wounds on every four to hit right okay. that's amazing but at the same time you can um you can go to the realm of light and you can have the binoculars i forget what its real name is and you can turn off and, and every d3 mortal wound every unit in three inches takes uh, six inches takes is reduced by d3 so that spell i talked about earlier where someone is doing potentially 3d3 mortal wounds to every unit in your army you can actually reduce that by d3 every turn so effectively they might be doing or on average they do nothing to your army mm. right and it's and it's a complete counterpick artifact and that's something that's open to anyone and it's open to anyone so like the options are that's why i said about permutations it's incredibly exciting some of them will just be so much better than other stuff and that's fine because then that becomes the heel you need the heel right everyone needs to like really not like triple h otherwise how can the rock be cool <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking about things from the, the Malign Sorcery box set where the, all the endless spells come. Uh, and it also has a companion book in there that has a, just a ton of rules. Yes. And options and spells and artifacts and for both wizards and fighty dudes or so both is the case maybe if they have the right keywords. What's your favorite realm, Paul? Uh, that's, you know, I don't know yet. I don't know. I try to be themey. So I really tried to be like I wanted to really like the uh, what is the the endless spell that is the life swarm scarabs or something like that. Yeah, life swarm. I don't, I don't like it. I don't like it as much as I like cogs. Cogs uh, really uh, was fun to play with last night. <laughs> well, yeah, co co and I think everyone's going to go to cogs, which is why I've gone to shackles. Shackles is my my number one pick. And now you said you said this in the chat, like if you can't move, you can't play. Or I think you said that in a, in Twitter on Twitter. Yeah, you can't move, you can't play. Uh, yeah, which is um, w yeah, when you're trying to like when think about this thing, the missions are going to have objectives, and and some of those objectives, you know, uh, are things you're going to have to move to. And if if it, it, we we just talked about like the hero and the movement phase being such a big part of the game, and I can see how you you would feel that way or, or think that about the that power. This is an endless spell that reduces the movement of people around it. So yeah, so it's. You set up, um, you set up the shackles. There are three models for the shackles. That's what's really important, and they can be up to, but no further than six inches apart. And when you do that, and because there are three, you can obviously make a triangle. And I'm sure that was intentional, right? A Bermuda triangle, which I think is really cool. I'm super into that. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And every unit within six inches of one of those shackles in the movement phase has to roll a dice. And on a three up, they halve their movement. On a six up, they take D6 mortal wounds. But if you think about that as board space, that's a huge area. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's, Especially it's in 20... the early phases of the game where people are in their deployment zones and a little bit more compact than they probably would be. Exactly, it's 24 inches. So you can just go, you can just have one wizard cast um, the mirror spell um, onto one of your wizards, onto one of your heroes, and then you that what wizard can then cast the shackle spell. Um, and then just shackle that into your opponent's army. Again, this would imagine if you were going first and your opponent wouldn't get to choose whether or not you did. And now you've just got... Every one of your units, yeah, cool, your Vampire Lord on Zombie Dragon's got a cape, and now he's movement 18. But now he rolls a 3-up, and he's actually movement 9. Don't belittle my cape. I'm not belittling your cape. Your <laughs> cape would make you movement 5, yeah? You wouldn't have even got to use your cape. <laughs> but there's going to be so much, and that might be terrible. Like, here I am sat here going, that's definite. And I'm like, that might be awful. Well, it's, you it's just not don't a lot know. of points. It's like you have to pay points for the endless spells. And what you're talking about is, is a huge upside, and it's fairly inexpensive, so easy to work into your army. 60 points to do that. Yeah, and there's also a mechanic to where, and this is this is actually what I found myself, and this is the last thing we'll talk about. I know we're rambling just a bit, but uh, in the list phase part of the game where I'm building my list, there is there's a mechanic to where for every 50 points that you don't spend, I think what you get command point. Yeah, uh, yeah. Every 50 points you spend, you don't get you you get you an extra. Spend. You that you don't spend, so that doesn't include war scroll battalions are spent. That's spent money, yeah. um, so you don't, that doesn't count. So um, yeah, and us endless spells that spent money. So well, just, right. It, so I find myself: do I do I want an extra command point for some sweet ability, or do I want to just toss in a random endless spell and see what happens? Well, that's why the battalions are so strong, right? Because you get a bonus. So battalions, by the way, and something I didn't mention, you also get abilities from battalions. So yeah, you take the battalion. Yeah. It's not just being able to take a one drop. It might also mean all of your guys get plus one save or plus three to charge, or and some of them are a lot better than that. Um, some of them allow you to like deep strike your units, or uh, th there's a variety, and so some of them. And it's very literal. So if you're playing a battalion that has another battalion in it, you, both the rules carry forth, and you get everything. Exactly. There. So so you're paying points for extra abilities, extra artifacts, extra command points. Effectively, most battalions got cheaper in the new General's Handbook 2018 compared to last year, but you also get command points and uh, access to different artifacts now which previously you didn't have access to um so it, the the battalions are, are really are the future at the minute and, and as to whether or not that will change we'll see well, i find myself as a do i want this extra command point for for saving these banking these 50 points or do i just want to jury you know kind of mess with the list a little bit to see if i put an endless spell in there that might make some some type of uh, benefit to me or just be fun to play with yeah, I, I, I don't. Uh, apart from some armies like Flesh Eater Courts, that like that they make loads of sense to drop points because their command abilities allow them to summon units. So for one command point, so you drop fifty points for a command point on a Flesh Eater Courts army, they can uh, summon a unit that's worth one hundred and eighty points for that fifty point drop using one command point. So they're one hundred and thirty points up for that initial loss on turn one. On turn one, so that's smart. Um, uh, so yeah, so you know, realistically, if you wanted to, and it probably would be a little bit inefficient, you could build a flesh eater course army that, after the first, like, might deploy seventeen hundred points versus two thousand, but after the first turn is like two thousand four hundred points, two thousand five hundred points. <laughs> yeah, I like the sound of that. Well, Rob, man, thanks a lot for coming on and and talking to me about Sigmar in a very basic way. I'm I'm hoping to, uh, that. Well, I know this is going to be fun, and I've enjoyed playing games uh, leading up to this release, and it's just going to get better as more people get their hands on it and uh, and start to, to really sink their teeth into building these sweet lists that we're talking about. Uh, can I have you on again in the future to, like I said, to, to talk about some of this stuff and, and maybe as I get a better understanding, have a have a, have a a more in-depth conversation with you about tactics? A hundred percent. And I'd love to. And anyone that wants to come and uh, find me uh, over, obviously on this war game and like the the whole purpose of what we do is is to be really upfront about uh, units and how they can perform because there's nothing worse than front loading your expectation and then that not being the truth. If you know, but if you go into a battle knowing you've got an uphill battle, then you're fine. You're probably set up for that challenge and that's more fun in some cases depending on who you are. 
Um, so yeah, I'd love to come on the show and talk to you more. And we're going to be doing a lot of work, a lot of hard play testing, and a lot of to, to to give you some some ideas. Right? Someone asked me on Twitter the other day. They were like, "I really want to get into Age Sigma now. What army do I play?" And someone put, well, "What models do you like?" And I thought, "No, that's not." I was like, "Who are you?" <laughs> That's the question. Are you an aggressive player? Like, are you a cagey person? Are you an aggressive person? Do you like controlling your opponent? Do you like controlling people? Like, who are you? Then we can start to design you an army. Because that's how it, some people, you know, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're going you're gonna, to, you spend lots of hours with this. You get, and this is not, I'm not throwing this term around, you get intimate with this army. Uh, I mean, think about all the hours that lead up to painting and play, you know, and then, and then playing, you know, like moving the figures around the table, uh, is only a small part of what we actually do. I think you want to, you want to dig the army, you want to dig what the army's about. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's the, that, you do, and you, and you wanna, you wanna play that way. And so, um, hopefully so you gotta have something inside you that relates to that. So I agree with what you're saying. <laughs> if it was, yeah, or not, or not. This is your like weekend, right? And this is where you let loose. You know, you're like mild I'm manage- this weekend. This weekend, I am a dwarf covered in metal. <laughs> Like, all weekend you're out fighting fires, you're a fireman and you're a hero, and then what do you do the weekend? I just sit in a corner and shoot, this, and if anyone weekend, disturbs me, I just growl. I'm a daughter of Cain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, please, like, stop by and come and talk, and I'd love to come and talk again, because um, it's it's going to be really exciting, and I'm I'm excited. It's the permutations in the game that get me really, really excited, um, just because of the cool factor. It's just like I've done this thing. It's like that's amazing, okay. you know. And then it's only beyond that you go, oh, that's not fun though. Like that, yeah, you know, that's the follow up question. Well, that well, people, yeah, it'll get there. I'm sorry, people will uh, will pick things, and they should pick things to your point that they are actually drawn to on more than just uh, a a power game type level. Uh, people can find you. You mentioned you have live shows on Twitch. Uh, mm-hmm. You actually are very active on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, if people I'm have any be questions. Less active. I'm really feeling like I should be less active. <laughs> Just eat to the day. <laughs> well, I'm saying people have lots of ways they can reach out to you if they are Age of Sigmar curious and, yeah. and want to, to try to figure out what may be, what may be best for them uh, as the if people want to get into this edition. Yeah. I also do, um, I do uh, daily videos on Patreon. So, um, like, for instance, this week, everything that's gone up is a review of the different realm artifacts from Malign Portents. Um, so, like, and that's a big deal for keeping the show going and, and just stuff. So there's a daily video every day with unique tactical insights to, to some of this stuff, which is, which is quite a big deal and, and really helps me, you know, off the top of my head, I was able to, you know, relate quite a lot of information to you there. Um, it's because I got to do a bit of research. I sat out. I was sat in the sunshine researching today, so that was nice. But you know, when you got to sit in the dark cave and research, you think I should be outside. <laughs> Why am I learning what the realm of shadow weapons are? But it's because it's important. It's you important. Feel to it. know. <laughs> it's really yeah. Anyway, sorry. Thank you very much for coming on and spending this time with me. I hope you have a great night, and we will be in touch very soon. I got to tell you about uh, all the sweet, sick army list I'm coming up with. Have a good night. Forced Narrative is brought to you by DiceHead.com www.DiceHead.com Games, hub, supplies, and comics, they have it all. Hey everybody, welcome to Tournament Spotlight on Forged the Narrative. My name is Paul Murphy. I'm joined tonight by Eddie Draper. Hello. Hey man, thanks for joining me. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on, man. We're going to be talking about the Grand Tournament at Gen Con. 40K Grand Tournament. 2,000 points, right? Yep. yep. It's going to be 2,000 points. Uh, coming up August 3rd and 4th at the convention. So not only do you get a mega convention experience with 60,000 people, you also get a 40K Grand Tournament. Oh yeah, it's, it's going to be some exciting stuff. This is the this is not the first year you've done that. This has been, uh, I think, a staple there. It hasn't really been a, a huge staple for um, for a while. Um, Sean got it really going um, a couple years ago, and then he brought me on board to help uh, organize and run. Since I do a lot of the organizing and running here in Indianapolis, and I understand the logistics here around town better than he does. Oh, that you know. Every little bit helps, especially when you're organizing one of these things. And I know there are some there there are some hurdles sometimes doing it with you know hotel convention space and whatnot. Uh, but you mentioned you know running events in and around the area. This is a, this is the events kind of like the uh, the championship of a tournament circuit. Which heck, I'm proud to be a part of now with the Louisville Slugger that we just had. 
And but can you tell me just a bit about the the circuit? Yeah, yeah. So um, the the circuit idea was um, was part of um, me, Sean, and John down in uh, Kentucky. We 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 all met last year at the the forty k tournament at Gen Con, and we were like, hey, let's let's do something big because we're like, <laughs> we see each other all the time, you know. His the guys from Cincinnati come over to Indy. Indy guys go to Kentucky, and so we see each other. We're like, let's have a circuit. Let's try to bridge the gap between these large scale communities in these states and get these guys to travel around um, in just these three little states. And it, I think it's worked out really great bunch of tournament folks uh, in those areas and then you know you get something going and draw some other folks and you know and I, and I, I like the way it's going and I, I like all like the real community aspect of it I was as a, recently up there in Louisville and I mean I a great group of people. It was fun to play in that area, and everyone was focused towards a common goal of being competitive, but also having having fun. Uh, but you know, we we talked about that a bit. Uh, let's focus on the, the Gen Con tournament. This is the this is two days of a four day convention uh, yep. for a forty k tournament. And I believe you had some some great uh, uh, trophies last year from Games Workshop. I, I can only imagine there's going to be some great prize support for this year, either through you guys or through other sponsors. Uh, wh- what are some of the things that people are competing for? What are the top prizes? You know, how deep in in the uh, registry do you do you award? How does that normally go? Okay, um, so. Um uh, Games Workshop is back on board again this year. Um, the trophies, uh, showed up at, uh, Sean's, Sean's place, oh, a couple weeks ago. So we've got trophies for, uh, the 40k tournament, um, the, the finale for mags. Um, we've got trophies for Age of Sigmar. We got trophies for the doubles tournament, which is on Thursday. And, um, so that, so we have those trophies from them to hand out. Um, we've also got prize support being kicked in from a couple of the local stores. Um, we've also got, um, we had somebody fabricate a, a bolt gun. Um, an actual replica size bolt gun. Uh, we're going to be giving that way to the, uh, the champion for, for mags. Um, the, what else we got? Oh my gosh. We've got so much. Um, I know we've got Cromlick is kicking in stuff. Um, so there's so, some yeah, cool stuff it, to be had. I mean, I know oh, that yeah. this, this kind of stuff, you know, you're, you're playing for the glory as it were, but it's still nice to walk away uh, with something or the potential to win something. Uh, it keeps people engaged in playing games. Uh, what yeah. mission format are you using? So we're, we're going to use, uh, ITC champions, um, this year. And, um, we, I, I think we've been doing for just about all of the events. I think Glass City, which was the very first round, used something of their own. And as you saw at the, the Louisville Slugger, they used something of their own as well. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be ITC uh, champion missions. Yeah, that's something people are familiar with. Uh, kind of easy to get into the groove of now. Yep. They're trying trying to keep it e- kind of easy with uh, everything that's going on. I think last year there were around 60 players. Yeah, last year we had um, a little over 60. Um, this year we're estimating um, somewhere in the 85 to 100 mark. Um, we, we top out at 100 this year. Uh, Gen Con was generous enough to give us give us that much space um, for for the uh, tournament to happen in. Well, that's great. Uh, you know, I, I assume that you know I saw that you were working on some terrain earlier. Is there a big focus on that, making playable boards and and a good experience for folks? Yeah, um, we uh, we have a big focus on on terrain for for the convention. We see a lot of stuff. Um, I I personally I don't travel to a whole lot of bigger tournaments, but I see a lot of pictures and stuff. And um, after the whole London GT thing, which I don't want to get into, uh, that thing's a mess. But anyways, um, we were like, okay, we've got to step it up. We've got terrain that um we've already been preparing and now we're like okay it now needs to be better well that's that's great i mean it's all factors into the overall uh playability and fun of the event it's subtle things all add up i know that's also uh difficult to achieve but at least uh it sounds like you're going into it with the right mindset now uh to, in order to participate in the tournament you need to get, you need to get a convention badge as well as a tournament ticket so that's uh where can people go to purchase both of those things all right. So right now, um, you can go to, um, gencon.com and you can purchase your, the convention badge. 
along with your ticket for the um, for the tournament. Now, unfortunately, um, we've we've just passed the window where you can have those shipped to your house. So right now, the only way to get those is to pick them up at will call. Um, the will call window opens at noon on Wednesday and is open 24 seven to the end of the convention, which is like 6 p.m. Sunday. So if you're coming from out of state and you get here, let's say late uh, Thursday night or early Friday morning, you can just zip downtown, tell them who you are, and they'll give you your stuff and you're good to go for the next day. Uh, that, that's very cool. This is also something you will get to hang out and kind of meander about the convention, which I mentioned is a bit of a, you know, it's, it's a bit of a show. I mean, it's, that's a put, that's very lightly putting it. You're, you're, you can have a full weekend of four full days of kind of reveling in the gaming culture, uh, and then spend those last couple, uh, doing 40k. Yeah, it, it gets pretty crazy, uh, here in Indy. Um, Gen Con basically takes over all of downtown, all the hotels. Any public space is pretty much gaming for those four days. Um, I know the convention center never closes. They, they stay open. Um, actually they open Wednesday for the trade show, which is for, uh, manufacturers only. But after that, the convention center is open until the end of the convention. So even if, if people don't necessarily wear themselves out uh, during that first get day of gaming, there's a whole, essentially a whole other world out there for them to get involved in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was I was looking through some of the events myself, and I was like, oh, my gosh, there's stuff I can do late at night after, <laughs> after I run <laughs> well, the Well, that's one of the best off. things about these these conventions. I mean, I, I know that, you know, we're, we're talking about specifically about the 40K side of it, but there's there's a lot to do, and I think that's a kind of – that's. That's an, a big draw of the event is, of course, experiencing some of Gen Con. Uh, but then you're, you're really there with 60,000 other gamers. I mean, and that's not even an under, that's not an exaggeration that you're there with a ton of other gamers. And so it's, you get a real view into the epicness that is our community and culture right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, it's huge when, when, when Gen Con comes to town. Yeah. So yeah, it sounds like this is a, a neat thing. And then the, the tournament circuit. Now there, there are, uh, several tournaments that lead up to this, but you don't have to have participated in any of, any of those, uh, to still come and win the major awards at this grand tournament. Oh yeah. Um, it was something that me and a couple of the other TOs we were talking about right before the Louisville Slugger that, um, anybody that goes to, um, the Slugga and the Circle City, um, actually does actually stand to have a really good chance of getting up into, um, the top numbers. Um, I think we've got. I mean, that's for like, the overall circuit. Now you're talking about, right? Or, or, oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And, and even at Gen Con, we, we've already, we took steps already to make sure that, um, we have, we have trophies that are for the tournament specifically. So if somebody that is not really in the running to win the mags or the mid America gaming series overall, um, there's still something there for them. We, we also have another set of trophies set aside for the final standings for the tournament. Yeah, the actual itself. tournament. So yeah, it's just, yeah. it's just some bonus awards that are, that are in. You can, even at least in, even if you've never played any other, any other circuit events, you still come to this event. You can still win this event. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Uh, so what, what armies do you expect to see there? What is in the, uh, what, what you would consider your local tournament environment? Uh, what's some things that people should be prepared for? So, um, my local tournament environment is huge. Um, we've got about five TOs in the state, which I kind of lead the, lead the force on that. But, um, our, our meta is so huge that you could literally see anything. Um, we actually had just an event this past weekend and I saw everything from blood angels, bugs, orcs. Um, I saw two different type of orc armies. Um, we had a guy that was playing uh, a horde army, just nothing but boys. And then I myself, I was playing a dread mob. I was mainly walkers and dreads and I was just, I was just there to have fun, but I was, I was holding my own against some of these bigger tournament players. Um, we're going to see some Necrons guard. Um, you're going to see some Imperial soup armies. You're going to see some chaos soup armies. It's, uh, you're going to see, um, I, there's going to be a mix of just about everything. That's there. pretty cool. That's what we're seeing in other places too. I mean, there are some armies that, that do consistently do well, but you know, out of, out of 40 people, we're seeing 30 different armies or 30 different builds. And that's, that's really refreshing to see in eighth edition. You know, you, you know, 
it was a lot easier to do competitive analysis when you knew you were going to have to fight through, you know, two codexes. And now <laughs> it really is, uh, you know, anyone's guess as to what you'll face in round two and round three. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm a firm, I'm a firm believer that like the reason why the orc codex has been delayed as long as it has is because GW is looking at a lot of these tournaments and they're going, my God, the orc army is just crushing people because <laughs> my God. <laughs> and I think that's like, maybe, you know, a little wishful thinking on the orc players parts, but, uh, that now. is, that is something to hope for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I've, um, I think a lot of people are, are going to be surprised at, at what they see and what people bring. I know there was a re- a recent FAQ here um, within the past week or so that is definitely changing some of the meta a little bit, especially with Knights and Death Watch. I know they got their big FAQs, but I know there there was some other stuff that was changed as well. Oh yeah, yeah. This is a, this is a pretty uh, evolving environment that we live in, which is nice. I mean, I think once all the dust settles, this is this is probably going to be one of the most well it is it's it's one of the most fun additions we've ever had and that translates into great tournaments which is which is why we're talking about it i mean the 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 enthusiasm for tournaments is it's really high, and that's getting out participation. It's getting out the great people that, that just want to come and roll dice, uh, you know, while still trying to win. And, and that's really what you want in a tournament, if you ask me. And I think we're going to see it there at Gen Con. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, we're going to – I'm hoping to see more more players. Um, you know, as much as I love seeing the local guys come out and play, I definitely like to see new faces. Even if you've never been to Gen Con before – um, or if you've been to Gen Con and you've never taken part in the 40k tur- tournament, I highly recommend to, um, to check it out. Well, Eddie, man, thanks a lot for taking some time with me. Uh, we may have another opportunity to get together and talk about this both leading up to the event, but if, if we don't, I definitely want to have a recap with you after the event. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm totally down for that, man. All right, man, have a good night. Yep, you do the same.